TNIG. I, I request our President, Dr. Ram Sunim, to welcome the panelists. Sir Ram, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasant evening today. We have uh, four uh, interesting cases. And uh, like uh, gastrojejunocolic fistula, which uh, we hardly get to see nowadays, uh, ectopic uh, variceal bleed, and two other interesting cases, followed by a very important lecture by Professor Dr. Mahesh Goyenga. And uh, it's going to be a very interesting evening today. You can have the case presentation first. Dr. Pravin, please. Yes, sir. Sir, can you see my slide, sir? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Ah. Good evening, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank my chief, Dr. Shankar, sir, for giving me this title. Uh, a forgotten complication revisited. This is a very... Uh, uncommon condition uh, now in the last two decades is very uncommon because uh, uh, the indication for ulcer surgery, elective indications for ulcer surgery drastically came down. But however, the uh, emergency uh, indications are remaining same. And before uh, going to the case, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ganesh sir, uh, uh, medical gastro HOD from SRMC who had uh, dealt with the, all the workup and uh, diagnosis of this case. And after diagnosing, he gave this case to us for surgical correction. Going to the patient details, uh, the patient is a 50-year-old gentleman who came with the complaints of uh, loose tools for the past six months duration and weight loss uh, for the past six months and intermittent fecal and vomiting for the last six months duration. Uh, history of present illness, he was apparently normal six months back, after which uh, he started having uh, uh, loose tools, uh, which are insidious in onset, progressively increased in frequency. Uh, almost uh, when he attended to hospital, he was passing almost 10 to 15 times per day uh, without any uh, features of blood or mucus or pus in the stools. And intermittently, he gives history of passing a normal formed stools also. And he also gives complaints of intermittent fecal and vomiting. Uh, otherwise, uh, no history of any hematemesis or melina, fever or jaundice, uh, no history of any abdomen pain or abdomen distinction, and uh, he also gives history of significant weight loss. He almost lost 10 kg in the last six months duration. Going to the past history, he gives history of uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, surgery, uh, laparoscopic truncal vagotomy with gastrojejunostomy uh, for a cicatrizing diurnal ulcer uh, in SRMC itself, done by general surgery department. Uh, other than that, uh, he doesn't have any significant past history. Uh, medical risk factors also he don't have. And coming to the examination, he was uh, moderately built but poorly nourished. He was uh, vital are stable. And abdominal examination is unremarkable except for uh, previous uh, port side scars without any evidence of hernia. And a PR examination is normal uh, with the watery stools. Coming to the baseline investigations, uh, uh, CBC and uh, uh, RFT is normal. Uh, hemoglobin is uh, 9.4. And uh, LFT, LFT wise, uh, Almin is on lower side, uh, 2.0. Otherwise, uh, rest of the LFT is uh, normal. So with the previous history of uh, uh, surgery for uh, uh, peptic ulcer disease and uh, the uh, history of uh, loose tools and uh, as the clinic, mm, clinical history is uh, more in favor of uh, gastrojejunocolic fistula, we thought of... Uh, uh, going for a cross-sectional imaging in the form of CT enterocolysis, uh, which showed a uh, fistula between distal part of Francis colon and uh, GJ site without any obvious mural thickening or obstruction lesions. So going through the CT video, here we can see the, they did CT with the rectal contrast. We can see the ascent of contrast through the fistula's opening into the stomach as well as the uh, jejunal loops. And then we proceeded with the uh, colonoscopy. Uh, pardon me for poor quality of uh, video. Uh, this is a site of uh, fistula uh, where we are going into the jejunal loop from the fistula. 
this is the original loop coming back we can see three lumens uh, now we are entering into the uh, colon loop we can see the st stools there And then we did uh, endoscopy. Endoscopy showed uh, stomal site ulcers and uh, uh, evidence of uh, fistulas opening. And with this workup, uh, we came to the diagnosis of uh, gastrojejunocolic fistula. As uh, his albumin is on lower side, we optimized the patient with uh, uh, TPN uh, administration uh, for uh, uh, almost for 10 days. We optimized the patient for nutritional improvement. And then we planned for surgery. Our, uh, main uh, goal of surgery is uh, to interrupt the vicious cycle of uh, fecal contamination of uh, upper digestive tract and uh, to lead the patient to a better nutritional state that is one goal and uh, another goal is to cure the fistula and prevent the recurrence of uh, underlying ulcer disease so we went ahead with uh, triple resection and uh, completion vagotomy and reconstruction actually a uh, post operative period was uneventful uh, he was actually uh, discharged on 8th post operative day so coming to the surgical details, uh, this is an intraoperative picture which shows uh, uh, evidence of uh, uh, fistula, uh, gastrojejunocolic fistula. Actually, they did a laparoscopic uh, uh, posterior GJ, anticolic uh, posterior GJ. Here we can see above uh, stomach and uh, jejunum and below uh, colon. The afferent loop uh, they took was uh, 45 centimeters. Uh, laparoscopically, they, had, they did anticolic and they took, uh, we don't know, they took a bigger uh, afferent loop, which is also a risk factor for uh, uh, marginal ulcer formation. So these are resected specimen. We can see the opening in the stomach, uh, fistulous opening in the stomach, which we are probing through with the instrument. So histopathology uh, showed ulceration and inflammatory granulation tissue at the junction site without any features of malignancy or dysplasia. On the right side, we can see the small intestinal mucosa and the, this is the left side is the colonic mucosa. Now, coming to the discussion uh, proper of the topic, uh, this gastrojejunocolic fistula is a late and uncommon post-operative complication of uh, uh, gastrojejunostomy. Uh, other causes are uh, carcinoma stomach and transverse colon, chronic steroid usage, uh, uh, radiation, uh, uh, Crohn's disease and uh, penetrating trauma and even uh, bullet injuries. So today we will confine our discussion to uh, gastrojejunocolic fistula uh, uh, occurring after uh, uh, surgery for peptic ulcer disease like gastrojejunostomy. So main causes are uh, incomplete vagotomy, insufficient resection of stomach and retained antrum after gastrectomy and long efferent loop. So some of the high risk features are uh, smoking, NSAIDs, use alcohol, chronic anticoagulation, which leads to post-operative marginal ulceration, which often leads to gastrojejunocolic fistula. So the typical symptoms of gastrojejunocolic fistula are diarrhea and weight loss. And in one series by Marshall and Nud Hansen, uh, they reported that these uh, both symptoms were present in 80% and 82% of patients. And other less common symptoms are upper abdominal pain, GI bleeding, fecal vomiting, and fecal breath and uh, weakness. Weakness is due to mainly due to nutritional and as well as uh, electrolyte imbalance. And these patients are usually cachectic and dehydrated with the labs showing uh, malnutrition like uh, low hemoglobin and low albumin. And barium, uh, usual investigations are barium upper gastrointestinal series, gastroscopy and colonoscopy were used for diagnosis. And due to the treatment of peptic ulcers with H2 receptor antagonists and proton pump inhibitors and eradication of H. pylori, the need for elective surgeries for, for ulcer disease has been uh, decreased dramatically and hence uh, this complication also uh, decreased uh, dramatically. Uh, since the fistula can develop any time between one year to 20 years after surgery, uh, 
whenever we uh, find patients with peptic ulcer disease uh, encounter we have to give importance to uh, the previous surgical history also so better medical treatment at the face of stomal ulcer with uh, proton pump inhibitors and h pylori eradication play a great role in prevention of the disease and treatment directed towards only fistula is inadequate and we have to think of ulcer diathesis also so management comprises of n block resection of uh, fistula in the, uh, with the partial resection of jejunum and colon and uh, which involves the fistulous communication and restoration of continuity of the digestive tract previously uh, when uh, when the icu facilities are not good and when tpn is not introduced previously when these patients uh, used to present they used to present in very bad state bad, bad nutritional state and hence they used to, we used to operate uh, in stages actually initially uh, we used to take down the colostomy so that uh, divert the feces and uh, in, in then we have to wait for the patient to improve nutritionally and then deal with the primary disease means resection of fistula uh, three stage and two stage procedures are uh, documented initial uh, three stage means the first colostomy they'll do and uh, then resection of fistula and in third phase uh, third surgery we will take down the colostomy and in two stage procedures uh, two types are there in this one is uh, proposed by lahi uh, the where uh, iliosigmoid bypass is created first and then uh, fistula is resected uh, and subtotal gastrectomy and colectomy this is uh, one one method of a two stage procedure and another uh, is also uh, called pfeiffer's procedure where uh, they do resection of the fistula but uh, as the nutritional condition is not that great uh, they'll do double barrel colostomy that will be taken down in second uh, second stage so but uh, due to recent advances in parenteral nutrition and better intensive care facilities it was recommended to go for uh, one stage resection and to concluding my talk uh, gastrogenostomy alone should not be done for patient, uh, patients with uh, peptic ulcer disease. It should always be combined with uh, some form of vagotomy, especially trunkal vagotomy. And uh, diarrhea and gastrogenocolic fistula is not due to food entering the colon. The contents of colon enter the stomach and then jejunum resulting in uh, jejunitis, which is the main reason for diarrhea. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Praveen. And, uh... I think Dr. Pikret is not able to join. I, uh, sir, Ratna Sami, sir, are you there? Ubal, Ubal, can I can I interrupt for a minute? Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir, sure. Yeah, good presentation, but uh, uh, between the two and uh, barium solo meal follow through or barium enema. 100% of the choice is dairy edema because it is given under pressure. That is one thing. So the common question that is asked in DM gastroenterology those days, the oral, between the two, what would you choose? One, you have not mentioned anything about the rice tube aspiration before you should go for a apogee endoscopy, a common thing. And the third thing, the patient symptomatology for the particular odor. The major thing is a DJT fistula or a malignant. So putting your rice tube and uh, aspirating itself, it shows that uh, the patient has got this problem. Yeah. Third, jejunitis is producing diarrhea. More than that, the bacterial overgrowth subsequent to gastrogenocolic fistula is more important than jejunitis producing diarrhea. This is a small, humble uh, observation uh, can make. Uh, yes, yes, the presenter rightly said the diarrhea, severe diarrhea that causes severe uh, malnutrition is due to jejunitis, the colonic content entering the stomach and producing severe jejunitis and enteritis. Uh, on the same scale, one should do only a barium enema, not a barium meal follow through, because a barium meal follow through will immediately outline the whole of the VIP. It is not conducting barium see the stomach and the diagnosis is established. And, uh, Dr. Bala said uh, pickle vomiting and pickle and smell are the characteristics and these patients deteriorate very fast. And uh, ideally is to do a colostomy proximal to the fistula, the transverse column. That uh, the pickle contamination is taken off and the patient is subsequently taken up for uh, triple resection, that is resection of the colon, resection of the stomach, and resection of the jejunum. 
and the colostomy is also closed. Two stage procedure. That is the ideal thing that we do right now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Shankar, you want to say anything before you move on to the next case? So, uh, well, thank you for... Uh, uh, I just want to say that uh, with the advent of uh, actual receptor blockers and uh, proton pump inhibitors, the elective surgery for uh, peptic ulcer has almost uh, come to a standstill. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, still uh, we have a few cases uh, being operated sporadically, but now we, they are doing it laparoscopically. Uh, in the original surgery for peptic ulcer disease, we do what is called as uh, PV ring, posterior vertical retrocolic isoperistaltic, short loop or no loop gastro gastro oh, yeah. So when you My take own. the jejunum, uh, when you do a GJ retrocolically, there is a high chance, when, uh, whenever you have an anastomotic ulcer and it penetrates, there is a high chance of uh, gastro jejunocolic fistula. But interestingly, in this particular case, it was an anticolic GJ, but still uh, very uh, surprising to find out uh, the anastomotic ulcer has penetrated into the colon. So that's the only point I want to say in this particular patient. So it was an anticholic GJ, but still resulted in a fistula. Upal, Thank you, uh, can you tell one point? Upal, one point, please. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, to, uh, the, what uh, Shankar told, I'll put it in pneumonic PV ring, posterior vertical retrocolic isopolistic no loop of gastrogenism myo. Another thing in the commonest causes of post cyber pain, gastric ulcer, pancreatic problem, and uh, mesenteric ischemia. Those days, the fifth cause was discussed. Gastrogenism colic fistula without the uh, agatomy. Those days, now it's removed. This is the only cause I want that. Right, thanks. Uh, another Thank point you. the Thanks. presenter told that the surgery, the history of previous surgery for peptic ulcer is very important. And patients who are coming after 20 years or 15 years, one must also remember the cause of gastrogenocolic fistula as a gastric malignancy, stump carcinoma. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, this complication nowadays, actually, recent slicing, I think, I don't think there's a chapter on post GJ complication. I think it is totally gone. So these are all only uh, seniors like uh, uh, Ratnaswamy and uh, Bala sir and uh, uh, Venkat. They elicited all the mnemonics, everything. It is uh, uh, nowadays textbook and uh, recent postgraduates are not very aware of these conditions. So we move on to the next case and uh, I request. Uh, can, I, can I just interject for a minute, Dr. Ganeshi? Sir, please, sir. <laughs> Vanilla. Uh, apart from this case, I think recently we had one more case, young fellow, about 37 years old, who presented to us with chronic diarrhea again, with massive weight loss, and probably with a history of passing food, as taken. Sometimes it is a very important history which tend to miss. So if that is there, then it probably indicates one intestinal hurry or probably a communication, abnormal communication. And this person, because of chronic diarrhea, we did a endoscopy again, colonoscopy. And we colonoscopy, we found a fistulous communication just in the descent, just beyond the sigmoid. It went deep into the small intestine, and then we did the endoscopy again. Endoscopy also at D3 showed a ulcerated lesion, which is also communicating below. Both the biopsies came as adenocarcinoma. It's not very uncommon. Probably, I think we need to probably look carefully at it and then probably see. So this is another case because of malignancy, colonic malignancy or stomach malignancy, probably infiltrating into the adjacent tissues. So this is, again, uh, a very, very, very rare, but probably one should be aware of the possibility that apart from peptic ulcer, malignancy is probably more common now than than peptic ulcer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We will move on to the next case from uh, MMC. Sir, are my slides visible? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Make it full screen, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. I will be presenting a case of unusual case of ectopic paracel bleed. So patient presentation, a 37-year-old female, resident of Chennai, she came with complaints of recurrent hematochasia since last five months, yellowish discoloration of sclera since last two months, EC fatigability and giddiness since last two months. Uh, patient was apparently all right five months back when she first noticed passage of few drops of bright red blood along with stools. It was one to two episodes per day initially. It was intermittent. There were no complaints of abdominal pain or perianal pain during the defecation. 
there was no complaints of hematemesis or marina there was no complaints of any mass descending per rectum no complaints of constipation or loose stools and there was no complaints of tenesmus or urgency uh, there was yellowish discoloration of sclera and high colored urine since last two months which was insidious in onset progressive in nature without any proto it was not associated with pruritis or clay colored stool it was not waxing in bleeding patient had a very significant past history patient had underwent laparoscopic cholecystectomy for acute calculus cholecystitis in january 2015 Post cholecystectomy, the patient had persistent bile leak, and the source was a cystic duct stumpy, for which the patient had to undergo ERCP with CBD stenting on the uh, 10th February 2015. Due to persistent bile leak, patient underwent hepatic jejunostomy uh, two weeks after the previous procedure. Within a year of surgery, patient developed anastomotic stricture at the hepatic jejunostomy site, and patient had to undergo a radiological balloon dilatation with percutaneous biliary drainage. After that, patient was doing well for the initial six months, six years. for the last five months patient had a hematochezia so for this patient had a history of multiple blood transfusion in private hospital for correction of anemia in the last five months patient had no other comorbidities patient had no other surgeries in the past and there was no past history of any intake of any nsaids or anticoagulants personal history patient was consuming mixed diet there were no addictions sleep and bladder habits were normal uh, she had two normal vaginal deliveries and at present patient had oligomenorrhea treatment history patient was only on paracelpid and multivitamins since last year for correction of anemia and family history was not significant on examination on a general physical examination patient was found to have tachycardia patient was had a b to be a blood pressure on a lower normal side of 90 by 60 patient had pallor patient had ectus patient had spindle edema on systemic examination on a cardiovascular patient had a normal heart sounds and there were no murmurs and on respiratory system there were aerentary biliary equal and there were no adventitious sounds on examination of her abdomen it was scaphoid uh, all the quadrants were moving equally with the respiration there were four small scars of the previous laparoscopic cholecystectomy and there was one midline vertical scar of around 12 cm which was extending from the zephystinum just below the zephystinum up to the umbilicus and there was a splenomegaly a 2 to 3 cm rotated uh, just below the left costal margin no other palpable mass no free fluid and a liver span of around 12 cm and on digital rectal examination she had normal fecal stain tone was normal there were no fresh blood or melina at present no palpable growth or no palpable mass was on felt there were no external hemorrhoids and there was no anal fissure so a provisional diagnosis based on her history was the patient had recurrent hematochezia with jaundice and revaluation status post laparoscopic cholecystectomy status post ercp with cbd stenting for post cholecystectomy bile leak status post balloon dilatation of stricture at hepatic jejunostomy site with query possibility of recurrence so patient underwent some uh, investigations for the same on cbc she was found to have a hemoglobin of 6.2 total counts were normal uh, platelets were around 89000 inr was normal electrolytes urea creatinine was normal viral markers were negative on lft patient's bilirubin total bilirubin was 8.3 direct bilirubin b 6.4 she also had transaminitis patient alkaline phosphatase level was 534 and albumin level was 2.7 uh, further on further investigation patient had undergone abdominal doppler usg A liver of 10 cm with normal eco texture, a spleen of 14 cm. There was mild ascites which was noted on USG. Portal vein, mean portal vein diameter was 15 mm. A uh, mean velocity was 12 cm per second. There was hepatocortical flow. There was absent flow in the left branch of the portal vein, but there was no cavernous transformation of the main portal vein. And there was an ecogenic mass which was noted at the hepatic jejunostomy site, and intrahepatic biliary radicals were dilated. on upper gi endoscopy we were not able to locate any esophageal any gastric or any duodenal varices there were no obvious growth visualized in any of the uh, anywhere there was no obvious source of any ulcer growth in it so upper gi endoscopy was totally normal for this patient we further went with colonoscopy the colonoscopy the colonoscope was passed up to terminal ileum 10 cm terminal ileum up to 10 cm was normal ic wall were normal cecum to anal canal was showing normal mucosal and vascular pattern there were no erosions polyp or any ulcer visualized no abnormal growth no diverticular was visualized no visible blood was visualized in the lumen throughout and there were no rectal varices no colonic varices there were no internal hemorrhage also visualized on colonoscopy we further i have went ahead with the uh, technetium scan on technetium scan there was no radio uh, tracer distribution anywhere apart from the intravascular compartment so it was a normal rbc scintigraphy and there was no evidence of any localization of the gi bleeding site further the patient underwent ct abdominal angiogram on ct abdominal angiogram on the arterial face the right hepatic artery was not seen from the hilum the segment 4 artery was seen to collateralize with the branches of right hepatic artery on the portal venous face we can see uh, we can see this uh, blue arrow this blue arrow is shown as showing the normal main portal vein and this branch is the right branch we are not able to see the left branch 
and on this this is the sma which we can see on the, from the sma we can see a large collateral vessel which is coming up here and it is going up where it is going i'll be discussing in detail so a large collateral vessel from the superior mesenteric vein which was going towards the hepatico jejunostomic side and it was forming varices and it was also giving a portopotal collaterals into the liver through that uh, segment 4 and last on the transverse section we can see there were varices at the edge side and there were intrahepatic biliary reticular dilatation patient underwent diagnostic digital subtraction angiography the first image which we see is a superior mesenteric arteriogram in which we can see this artery and the branches there were no extra vegetation of any contrast seen so the arterial source was not the bleed on the delayed phase we can see this main branch this is a superior mesenteric vein on from the superior mesenteric vein we can see one large branch which is going upwards this is the large jejunal branch which is going towards the jejunal loop of the hepatico jejunostomy so a clear view of this this is the superior mesenteric vein a large jejunal branch with three tributaries and this is nothing but this is supplying at the hepatico jejunostomy side so delayed phase shows flow from this hepatic uh, spina uh, smv into the this large jejunal collateral veins which are supplying the main branches which are supplying the varices at the edge side and they were directly terminating in the segment 4 so they were giving branches of portopotal collaterals apart from that the main portal vein the right branch of the portal vein and the splenic vein were normal and the left branch of the portal vein was thrombosed so you can see here where you one needle is passed and this needle is passed into the spleen and through the spleen the contrast has been injected so this is the splenic vein which we can see this is the normal portal vein which we can see and this is the right branch but left branch could not be visualized so a final diagnosis based on the history and or based on the investigation was the patient had a case of it's a case of obscure gi bleed and compressive bilopathy which was secondary to the varices at the hepatico jejunostomy side which was most likely secondary to post surgical altered anatomy and the main feeder vessel which was the large jejunal collateral from the superior mesenteric vein so management wise first and foremost we need to stabilize the patient so uh, we followed a restricted transfusion policy that we had to maintain a hp of between 7 to 8 so patient were given blood transfusion patient was given prophylactic antibiotics patient was given a octreotide infusion uh, patient was on pantoprazole infusion and then there was a multidisciplinary team which was following up this this patient among a radio gastroenterologist intervention radiologist and medical gastroenterologist so we planned for this patient we had a two approaches for this patient primary and secondary i'll be discussing those so primary approach was we planned for embolization of this ectopic varices so when we see this we image what they did was they to the transhepatic route they entered the patent right right branch of the portal vein right branch of the portal vein main portal vein superior mesenteric vein and the jejunal branch so till the jejunal branch they went and here they they have inserted the contrast so you can nicely see all the collateral going up and uh, this was the thing what they planned was all these three branches they had to individually individually embolize so you can see one branch was thrombolized here second branch you can see a, a mixture of uh, glue and lipoidal was uh, given so final picture which came was like this this was the pre embolization picture and this was the post embolization picture to confirm that there was no leak there, there was one check angiogram which was done after that after half an hour of the procedure it was showing the second picture completely there was no extra vegetation on the very next day we again planned for a usc abdomen for this patient so there was significant reduction in the collaterals at the hepatico jejunostomy site with reduced flow ectopic varices at the edge site were not at all visualized now there was mild ascites in the pelvis the main portal vein was normal there were multiple small collaterals seen at the hilum with few collaterals which were entering the liver parenchyma which were also seen in the previous scan and the left branch of the portal vein was thrombosed follow up of the patient was patient on the very first day post procedure had a hemoglobin of 5.8 bilirubin of 8.6 direct and the uh, sorry total bilirubin and a direct bilirubin of 6.9 with a alp of 456 on the day 7 her, her bilirubin improved to 7.2 i'm um, sorry her hb improved to 7.2 her bilirubin has decreased almost half the rate and on day 28 as we can see from 5.8 her bilirubin has decreased uh, from 5.8 her hb has improved to 9.6 a bilirubin is almost normalized her alp is almost normalized so a word on this ectopic varices uh, the ectopic varices are nothing but they are dilated splanchnic or dilated photosystemic collaterals which are outside the normal esophago cardiopathic junction they represent 2 to 5% of this varicel bleed they are four fold increased risk of bleeding as compared to esophageal varices because they are in larger they have a larger diameter they have thin walls the mortality is as high as 40% if this patient presents with a massive ugi bleed or massive bleed management strategy will vary according to the site of varices and there are no uh, standard guidelines till date 
and ideal management should not only address the hemostasis because our job should not only to control the bleed but also to address the etiology why it has happened so based on the broad etiology there are two types of the acute viruses can be classified on two types first it can be secondary to generalized portal hypertension which is called as oncotic or non occlusive second can be an occlusive type which is splanchnic venous occlusion any local or segmental components which leads to some occlusion will lead to formation of local or typical choroides so occlusive type can be secondary to thrombosis of the splenic vein mesenteric veins or its tributaries or portal vein this can be secondary to some post operative adhesions scarring or post operative altered anatomy they are very much located in the vicinity of the post operative or surgically altered anatomy site typical procedures which are associated are gastrectomy ileostomy or balloon occluded uh, retrograde transvenous obliteration of the gastric varices ectopic gastric varices and duodenal varices are associated with drto or splenoportal thrombosis so this on basis of their location they are classified into luminal and extra luminal luminal will be ectopic gastric varices duodenal varices jejunal varices colonic varices stomal varices extra luminal will be gallbladder varices and gallbladder vesical uterine vaginal or even diverting urinary ileostomy for which uh, due to injury to some urinary bladder a part of the ileum which is used it that can also develop some sites as ectopic varices ectopic varices based on vascular shunting standpoint this is something new for us either they can be purely portopotal collaterals either they can have a predominant portopotal collaterals or they can have predominant portosystemic collaterals so just imagine this uh, two pictures the two pictures are showing this is a lumen of the gi tract this is a portal side circulation this is a systemic side circulation for any varices either of the pattern is followed throughout the body so in first varices there will be an upfront vessel which is supplying the varices and there can be either portosystemic collaterals or portopotal collaterals or there can be no portosystemic collaterals or only an efferent vessels will be there on the basis of this thing there will be a, there is a classification which is given there so type a are the one in which the involved portal circulation is not obliterated it is totally normal more oh, totally normal whereas in type b it is occluded so these are further subdivided into type 1 type 2 type 3 what are this each we will see individually so what is type 1 type 1 is the one in which there is no portosystemic collaterals no portosystemic collaterals so type 1 as one is there it are as type a is there it is the, the portopotal varices are portal outflow is dominant the only flow is through the portal side involved branch whichever branch it is either the splenic mesenteric or portal vein it is patent this is not common in vision this are which usually are not common in patients who are having a generalized portal hypertension type b are the one which are also the same but only the involved portal vein here is thrombus these are mostly seen in duodenal and mesenteric varices in the absence of portal hypertension due to some localized tumor in the duodenum or the mesenteric side this is typical of also gastric varices in segmental like in the sidereal portal hypertension in which we don't have a gastro renal shunt so this was type 1 which is purely porto portal collaterals and in this is important why because in this patient brt won't be any of, of any use because there is no porto systemic communication there second type is predominantly porto portal collaterals here also a and b a is a non occlusive b is occlusive you have the portal here there are both branches as we can see here the blood is going in the portal side as well as in the systemic side but the systemic side is non dominant the systemic side is rudimentary so this involved portal venous branch here is patent and this can be seen in mesenteric varices in the presence of generalized portal hypertension yes there is a component of porto systemic collaterals here so this can be seen in say, patients of generalized portal hypertension type 2b in which the involved portal varices branch will be thrombosis so this are seen in absence of portal any localized pathology which is leading to varices can lead to varices in absence of portal hypertension only the vessel involved should be occluded finally type 3 uh, type 3 uh, type 3 is basically the predominant flow is towards the porto systemic side rather than going to the porto portal side so this is most common type which we see in any generalized uh, portal hypertension side and this is most commonly seen in gastric varices in generalized hyper uh, portal hypertension with a gastro renal shunt this gastro renal shunt will basically serve as a porto systemic shunt here and the same gets followed for type 3b the, this the portal vein the involved vein is thrombosed and this patients are segmental portal hypertension patient who are having a gastro renal shunt so these are the three types if we know the pathophysiology behind this we can uh, it helps in the management of the patient so based on this hemodynamics what we need to assess if we see any ectopic varices first and foremost thing we need to know are the whether this assess the meso meso portal circulation whether it is occluded or whether it is non occluded in the occluded type whether the occlusion and there is a major porto systemic collaterals or whether there are major porto portal collaterals our first job in occlusion was to relieve the occlusion either we can canalize the portal vein or whichever vein gets obstructed or uh, if it is not successful 
once it is successful it will release the portal size it will release the obstruction it will decrease the size of the varices if it is not successful then we need to go for proximal portal systemic shunts which will bypass the tract and which will help in the flow of the blood and with this we can also go for sclerosis only thing which we need to remember in sclerosis if you are going to sclerosis there should be some collateral which are patent otherwise that can that can lead to varices at some other side also and if this it is due to secondary to some generalized portal hypertension a primary objective is to have the decompression this decompression can be primarily done by either tips or it can be done by mesoclavian shunt in some patients we can we usually require because in some patients typically the patient who are having rectal varices duodenal varices this patient even though their hepatic hepatic venous pressure gradient is less than 12 less than 10 still they are very high chance to bleed so in those patients we need an additional uh, procedure so in those patients we need to uh, even sclerose those patient so based on the hemodynamic circulation we can plan uh, according to the management for this one. so our patient was belonging to type 2a based on that we plan for uh, the We plan for the patient embolization, as we have shown, as a, it was not possible to thrombolyze anything. So we plan for embolization of the vessel. So this is the references which I have done. Thank you. Uh, yes, can you sir? Can go ahead. Bar, can I get in? Bar, this is Dr. Ragram. Can I get in? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Please, sir. Yes, I want to ask the presenter a question. What is the final diagnosis? You have done an extremely good job in managing the bleed, right? You have done an extremely good job. What is your final diagnosis in this case? Sir, my final diagnosis was a case of obscure GI bleed with compressive bilirubinopathy, secondary to varices at the hepatic or jejunal stomach side. Those varices are secondary to surgically altered anatomy with a component of portal hypertension. There is a portal hypertension. Yes, sir. When why should the why why should she develop an ascites and then uh, uh, low platelet count? What the uh, reason? Yes, that is what that is favoring. Is there a cirrhosis or no cirrhosis? Uh, on uh, USG, sir, the pico texture was normal, but the platelets were low. There was. Liver size is small. Liver size is small. Slightly, yes, sir. You yes, can't think of biliary secondary biliary obstruction. Yes, sir. We can. Secondary uh, biliary. Yes, sir. Uh, but the points which were going against was there were no other varices anywhere, sir. No, no. Yes. You manage only this. Yes, sir. Bleed. Yes, sir. Bleed only you manage. What about other? What do you want to warn the patient? One. I will give you in your clinical examination. I will find fault with you because you, you said history frank bleeding per rectum. Yes, sir. Fresh bleeding. You have not done a proper score. Have we excluded the uh, piles? Sir, on uh, colonoscopy, sir, we no, you can miss piles in colonoscopy. Yes, sir. You can miss unless you retrovert the score. Yes, sir. You can miss colonoscopy piles. Yes. Right. There is a secondary biliary cirrhosis here. Yeah. It is not isolated. Arises is occurred because of the obstruction at that portal site. Yes, sir. Well, and I, I have not seen your patient is John Dis. I have not seen in your investigation report hepatitis B, hepatitis C markers. Sir, it was there. It was there, sir. HIV, HBCG, anti-HIV were negative, sir. I didn't see. I'm sorry. I didn't see that. So your diagnosis should be secondary biliary cirrhosis, and then portal hypertension, segmental portal hypertension. Right. Even then, you can't explain the spleen migraine. Yes. If suddenly left branch of the spleen uh, uh, portal vein is affected, how do you explain the spleen migraine? Are you sure you will prevent further bleeding? Yes, sir. The patient uh, till date we are following up the patient, sir. Her HBS uh, improved and uh, uh, just uh, you have done such advanced thing. Where does the blood come from? Through the bile duct. Blood um, in the motion came from through the blind duct. Or sir, mostly, mostly, mostly it can be jejunal varices also. We were not able to. No, you have not seen the jejunal varices. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, what do you, how do you explain and explain the uh, GAB? Sir, do so it is most probably, sir, by by uh, biliary hemophilia. Yes, sir. Presenting as very unusual for a fresh bleeding to occur in a hemophilia, right? Unless it's a massive bleed, it's extremely yes, rare, extremely rare, right? So you are diagnosed with secondary biliary cirrhosis, and you have done a fantastic job. What you have done, management is fantastic. But you are a postgraduate, you know. I want you to answer these questions. Yes, sir. Right? You have done a good literature review. A fantastic. It's an it's an eye opener for me. So I have not seen in my experience so many forty five years as a gastroenterologist. I have not seen a viruses in the. Uh, After hepatic, we never used to see the hepatic. It was not me those days. Very, very rarely we used to do. 
There's an open polycystectomy. This lap polycystectomy only, this, all these biliary leaks are frequently occurring and you are getting the problems, right? Yes. Patient has got secondary biliary cirrhosis, right? That's the, that's the diagnosis. Plus, bleed with the GAB. Yes. GAB, the secondary is to localized varices. Probably the, uh, near the biliary tree. Yes. Right? One, 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 one uh, abstract thinking is you could have done a cholangioscopy and burn the, burn the varices. Why go through this varices? You have got a cholangioscopy? Sir, we did, uh, but uh, sir, on uh, upper GI endoscopy, this patient had a respiratory distress, so we had to abandon the procedure in between, sir. So that is. I see, I see, that's okay. That, no, no, is that another option to do that? Yes, sir, we can do, sir. Uh, through cholangioscope, you can burn the varices? By biliary varices? Sir, through push endoscopy, we can go and. Uh, Not the, push endoscopy, cholangioscopy. I'm saying cholangioscopy. Is it possible or not? This is my thinking. I do not. I don't have answer. Right. Thank you, Doctor. Very well, nice presentation. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Well, Ubal, can I make a few points? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you? Uh, due to time constraints, I would like uh, to ask only a few questions to the presenter. What made you think of ectopic viruses? Sir, on the, sir, on the... suspect ectopic viruses. Uh, yes, sir. sir. On CT abdominal angio, sir, because all the things were no, all the things were negative for this patient, sir. We did a upper GI endoscopy, we did a lower GI endoscopy. All the things were negative. Only on the basis of uh, the patient underwent a poor ultrasound. On ultrasound, there was some ecogenic mass at the level of the hepatico jejunosomies type. So, apart from post-operative additions, what which can happen there and which can lead to compression, which can be secondary some due to some uh, enlargement of the collateral waves. So, that made us, uh, it can be a secondary due to that also. And the technetium 99 labeled uh, scan doesn't have much role in the... Uh, diagnosis of uh, ectopic varix. Sir, those technician right. label scans are only uh, appropriate when the patient is actually bleeding, sir. It can detect a level of less than or equal to 0.1 ml per minute also, but it, the patient should have active bleeding at the time when they, they are doing it. Only at that time, the radio tracer will go out to the particular site. Otherwise, the when the patient is not bleeding, so it won't be able to, or it won't be of much help. What is your, uh, what is, what will be your first line of uh, investigation? Make us when you suspect an ectopic varix. Sir, ectopic varix, where, sir? When you, when, you, when you suspect an ectopic varix, what will be the uh, uh, first, uh, second line uh, um, modality of initiation? Sir, first I will screen upper and lower GI cells. Sir, first I will go for upper uh, upper GI endoscopy. Next. If it is negative, then we can go for colonoscopy. First, plus, uh, firstly, we have to screen these both parts, sir. Only after that, we can go for further research, sir. No, after upper and lower G endoscopy, uh, contrast enhanced uh, CT will be the Yeah, next. contrast enhanced CT happens. We didn't want to expose the patient again and again to CT exposure, so we restricted it, sir. Oh. What is BATO? You would uh, put in one of your B slides. BRTO is basically we go through the systemic side, sir. Through, we go through the femoral vein, we go through the renal vein, through the from there we occlude the branch uh, gastrointestinal. Here we go from the venous side, portal venous side, sir. Is this balloon anti-grade approach, sir? Does capsule endoscopy have any role in... Uh, uh, yes, sir. Direction? Capsule endoscopy, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Capsule endoscopy has a role, sir. Definitely. But uh, in post-surgery, if their patient has some post-surgery, are there better to avoid, sir? Because uh, chances of getting impacted, uh, although in not in our patient, but in our patient, the track was not normal, sir. It would have not gone into the jejunal loop, sir. Different jejunal loop, it would not gone. But sir. it has no role in an acute setting. Yes, sir. Capsule endoscopy has no role in an acute setting. Yes, sir. What yes. is the role of surgery in the treatment of ectopic varix? Uh, sir, it depends, sir. If, uh, if uh, first and foremost thing, we I have to undergo medical and medical and endoscopic therapy. If that is not possible, then we'll go for some intervention radiology. And if that is also not possible, then so surgical ligation of the varices, either for if the patient is having ileostomy, you can uh, uh, recorrect this ileostomy, or uh, if the patient is having varices from other parts, you can uh, suture it. Or if the patient is done, then we can go for surgery like visocaval shunts. Same as tips, we can go for shunt surgeries. What about resection and anastomosis? Ah, yes, sir. That is for ileostomy, sir. If they, 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 I mean, any, any stoma, sir, any stomal varices. Stomal varices or any localized varices due to some tumor which is getting compressed and forming. So we can resect and we can uh, anastomose the part. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Obal.
Kani, you are a tough examiner. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Arun. I think there are some questions in the chat box also. You can see and reply through the chat box. So you move on to the because the time shortage, we move on to the next case. I call upon uh, uh, Dr. Vishnu from Global to present his case. Uh, Palnipan will give the next expert comment. Vishnu. Good evening, sir. I'm ready. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Make it a full screen. Yeah. yeah. So my topic for today is uh, endoscopic submucous in the section to be the learning curve. So I thought I'll present a few of the cases which was done recently. So these are the cases fit for ESD, a mucosal tumor or a mucosal uh, tumor, which is just uh, 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 reaching the muscularis mucosa. They are the ideal cases. A tumor which has gone to the submucosa, the initial one third, the superficial one third layer of is involved, that tumors can also be taken out. So in uh, theory, less than 200 microns of invasion into the submucosa can be amenable by endoscopic submucosal dissection. Now we have a case of esophageal lesion with high-grade dysplasia, a gastric adenopathinoma, a rectal adenoma with low-grade dysplasia, and a sigmoid colon adenoma with high-grade dysplasia. Uh, in these cases, like, I'd like to highlight why I choose and why I'll not probably choose some of the cases in future. So this is a 45 year old uh, lady with a neurofibromatosis and she got jejunal NET. On routine endoscopy, she was found to have this lesion. The biopsy came as high grade dysplasia on biopsy. Uh, so, so this is the area which was abnormal on an NBI. We didn't depend on the NBI for diagnosis, but NBI is quite useful. The Japanese Esophageal Society has put up a magnification endoscopy classification for detecting early cancer. A type A is non-neoplastic, type B is neoplastic. In type B, if the IPCL, intrapapillary capillary loops, are dilated, tortuous, flower-like, they are called B1, they are most likely to be an epithelial cancer with a high-grade uh, dysplasia or a low-grade dysplasia. If there is non-looping pattern, abnormal vessel like this, that is type B, most likely they have, they might have invaded the, that cancer might have invaded the muscularis uh, mucosa. Or this uh, tortuous, thick, dilated vessel like this might probably have a submucosal extension B3 classification usually avoid endoscopic dissection because they they are more likely to have a nodal metastasis. We don't want that uh, type to be subjected for EST. So based on this classification, in the assessing from the G junction, we see that some of the IPCL pattern are uh, flower-like here, opening up, but still they are not that dilated or tortured. But coming little above, we see that here there are thick dilated vessels in an area of demarcation, some flower-like. They are not like a loop pattern; they are almost like flower thickened. That's the lesion with high-grade dysplasia. So ear marked with a coagulation process around. We have to dissect, the dissection margin should be beyond this uh, marked site. So once the entire plane is dissected, this is how the esophageal uh, mucosa is going to appear with an exposed uh, submucosal layer, a thin layer of fat over the muscle layer. And an exp uh, and the dissected specimen sh should be a non-block specimen, should be displayed like this on a cardboard or a piece of foam. And uh, we can spray some uh, uh, iodine uh, over it to mark the uh, normal area. The second case is a 65 year old male, a chronic liver disease patient who, who's compensated, only thing he had a bleed. So we did a banding and on post banding surveillance, we found the, the virus to be very short and uh, insignificant. But uh, apart from the gastropathy, he also had this uh, ulcer with uh, unhealthy mucosa, some grayish lux on some friability which was extending along the distal body and extending into the lesser curvature. Biopsy showed a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma, which came as a surprise. PET showed only a focal thin uptake here because it's well-differentiated, but the lesion was not extending beyond uh, into the serosal layer. EUS did not show an identifiable lesion, which was uh, infiltrating the muscular propria. We, uh, uh, we gave the risk assessment to the patient and uh, said the patient needs a subtotal gastrectomy. Uh, but he's 65, he refused to undergo the surgery after proper counseling. Uh, we thought the oncologist suggested us to attempt an ESD, which we were not uh, very confident because the cirrhosis patient is going to bleed a lot. And uh, we do not know because in the US, we didn't see a proper lesion which was uh, in the mucosa, not infiltrating the sub, uh, submucosa. Anyway, we went ahead, we attempted an ESD here. This is the lesion which was supposed to be superficial. I injected in the submucosa, but now we can see that the lesion was furrowing. The lift was not there in the site where there's a lesion. So this is an abandoned case of ESD. So we should know when to abandon the case also. This is the case of uh, uh, a 60 year old male who presented with the bleeding. A rectal uh, flat lesion is seen. This lesion is 
<clears throat> you can see that this is a smooth lesion. This is called a non-granular lesion. On uh, spraying the methylene blue, uh, dysplastic elements will not be stained by this methylene blue. So we know that that's a dysplastic element. NBA also will support. But uh, in this case, we are not talking about NBA. We are talking on uh, dissecting the cases only which are biopsy proven. So I took biopsy from the edges, which uh, turned out to be a tubular adenoma with high-grade dysplasia. So this was earmarked for uh, ESD. The margins are one centimeter from the margins of the tumor. And we have to cut uh, the dissect of the tumor, including the burnt areas also. So this is the tumor which is post-burn. The base is OK. The muscles are not uh, uh, divided. They are uh, very intact. Uh, the unlock specimen was removed. It took almost 90 minutes to remove. I used a hybrid eye knife. And uh, the entire specimen came as a tubular adenoma with high-grade dysplasia with clear margin. Post-procedure at 48 hours, patient had a mild self-limited bleeding. That is usual when we leave the exposed tissue like this. So we can either choose to close it, but uh, opening is also, uh, leaving it open is not such a bad idea because the bleeding is very, very minimal. We know that it's going to be minimal because after the procedure, we take time to burn the, all the exposed vessels with the coagulation process using soft coagulation. This is a case of incidentally detected rectal polyp on MRI. The MRI was done, MRI pelvis was done as an assessment for prostate. This guy was waiting for prostate surgery and uh, MRI showed the lesion and uh, sigmoidoscopy showed a uh, polyp. The biopsy came as well as adenoma with low-grade dysplasia. So we thought we'll go ahead and do a ESG. It's a short video. It's an NBI scope showing a nice two classification of a rectal adenoma. With adequate margin, it was earmarked on the oral, on the anal side of the lesion, submucosal injection was done and a conventional method of uh, incision was made almost in a semi-circumferential manner. Since it was rectum, I didn't uh, care to do a pocket creation method. I did a conventional way of uh, cutting almost half of the circumference and then coagulating the exposed vessels and the bleeding vessels with coagulation. Slowly submucosal injection was done step by step. Since it's a rectum lesion, we can expect more bleeding, which is quite okay, but we don't use adrenaline to inject in the submucosal area just to avoid any arrhythmogenic potential. Bigger vessels like these are uh, uh, grasped with the coagrasper forceps and with soft coagulation, they're even cut with the coagrasper forceps. If any bleeding is disturbing our vision, a water jet is mandatory to clear off the bleeding. And we always use CO2 in any case for, of uh, ESG. So underwater will expose the clear uh, bleeding vessels like this. Always having a water jet will clean up the bleeding. So slowly going from the uh, <coughs> uh, inner side and then going on to the oral side. Lesion is almost exposed and dissected. Now the base is carefully uh, examined and uh, any open vessels will be coagulated. A muscle defect will be clipped like that. This is the size of the lesion, which is almost 13 centimeters, extending from the anal to cephalic side. Procedure duration took four hours. Non-block resection was performed. Dual knife uh, uh, 1.5 mm was used. This is a histopathological specimen showing dysplastic elements in the tip. And uh, that is the muscularis mucosa. That is the submucosa. We, we don't see any infiltration even into the muscularis mucosa here in this case. So this is a hypower field showing all the dysplastic elements. There is low-grade dysplasia. There is a nuclear cytoplasmic disarray. There is some pseudo-stratification. But the nucleus is not as enlarged. And uh, <clears throat> this is not a case of hybrid. This is low-grade dysplasia. Now, this guy is a case of 60-year-old male who came with spurious diarrhea because of an obstruction. And he uh, presented with weight loss. He came with a CT showing a large uh, sigmoid colon polyp. Biopsy showed, uh, sigmoidoscopy and biopsy showed an adenoma with high-grade dysplasia. So we went ahead and did an ESD here. This was a difficult case. Um, on a hindsight, I would have been happy to give it to a surgeon. But anyway, uh, since uh, he's 60, he didn't want uh, any invasive surgery. He asked us to do so. We did the EUS to confirm whether the lesion is still in the mucosa and whether it has not invaded the uh, submucosa of the muscular propria. You can see that the submucosal layer of white plane is well preserved. The lesion is not invaded the submucosa. We use a dual knife. With a soft coagulation, we mark the periphery of the lesion, giving one centimeter margin away from the lesion. And uh, here again, I start the incision from the anal side, not the other side. This is the first step of an incision. And then once the incision is made, the vessels will be exposed. Soft coagulation is used to coagulate the exposed vessels. Once the other side, uh, oral side is finished, we have to come back from the 
Once the anal side is finished, we have to come back from the oral side, check the lesion. This was a very large lesion. It took almost four hours for me. And there was a muscle defect, which I clipped, closed it with the three hemoclips. The resection uh, in sigmoid could not be retrieved. Uh, I mean, the uh, specimen could not be received, uh, entirely uh, extracted on block. So I had to cut the specimen piecemeal and then remove. So this was a difficult case because the sigmoid colon being intraperitoneal, it kept on moving. Um, one side cut will not stay in the same area and the scope will be in a very bent position at an angle. This is just right across the rectal sigmoid, almost like doing it in a, a splenic flexure. So kind of a difficult case. But uh, having uh, said that, like now this being a large, large lesion and it, being in the sigmoid colon, we did it, uh, but it's a difficult case. If it comes again, I'd be probably happy to send it to a laparoscopic surgeon. So this is a specimen not infiltrating the muscularis layer uh, and the submucosa is clear here. This is high grade dysplasia. This is the dysplastic elements in large nucleoli. So you can see that there is a total loss of uh, array of the nuclear pattern. So an EST, <clears throat> the difficulty level, a gastric antrum ESD is much more easy. A rectum is the next easy one followed by esophagus. The one which is in sigmoid colon, ascending or transverse colon, there is an peritoneal part of the colon, they are all difficult. And one which are in the uh, flexures are more difficult. And a lesion which is on the IC valve is much more difficult. The complications expected in an ASD, the most common complication is a bleeding, which is intraprocedural and postprocedural. Intraprocedural bleeding has to be uh, tackled by the endoscopist uh, with the adequate skills using the soft coagulation, uh, the ball tip coagulation, uncoagulas the forceps. A delayed complication after 48 hours is more likely to occur if the specimen at the raw area is exposed and if it's not closed, but they're all manageable and it's mainly self-limiting. The way to prevent a post-procedure complication is to expose the uh, uh, post-ESD area and uh, identify the small, small vessel and coagulate it with a, uh, a closed coagulation forceps on soft coagulation mode. Perforations are quite uh, <clears throat> are rare, but it's quite more common in colon because of the thin wall. In stomach, it's almost unheard of. We can use, if it's a small perforation in the muscle and a through and through perforation, we can use hemostatic clips to close or an endo suture, endo, uh, endo suture to close, which is more expensive. We can use an endo loop and a clip to form a purse string effect on the peripheries of the loop. Over the scope clip can be used to close a small perforation. A stenosis is more common in a narrow limb like esophagus. If we do EST for more than three fourths of the circumference of the esophagus, it's more likely to go into stenosis by forming a circumferential concentric, concentric uh, stricture. A superficial submucosal injection of uh, triencinolone post procedure usually prevents it because the reason for the stenosis is because the exposed layer of the uh, submucosa will have this myofibroblast. This myofibroblast will become more active in the first 15 days and they start forming this uh, contracture and uh, stricturous part. If we inject steroids, the myofibroblasts are kept inactive and the stricture is usually prevented. A polyglycolic acid sheets can be used to be placed on the exposed area to prevent stricture again. So generally, if the esophageal lesion is uh, uh, less than three-fourths of the circumference of the esophagus, the stricture rate is little less. So these are the tips in doing a colorectal ESD. If the tumor is less than five centimeter, we can start uh, straight uh, by looking from the anal side, we can make an incision. If it's more than five centimeters, better to cut from the oral side, retroflex the scope and cut from the oral side. Injection of hyaluronic acid is uh, more recommended so that the lesion, the uh, cushion stays in the submucosa and the fluid does not dissipate. So cutting the submucosa will be easy. Whereas available option with us is only saline. We usually dilute it 0.2% indigo carbon. Make the tumor parallel to the incision side. What does that mean? So if this is a lesion, here is a blue dot and a red dot. If I inject in the blue dot, the tumor will come perpendicular to the uh, incision knife. So the tumor will fall like this. So it will be a periventricular incision. If this is more difficult because the cutting plane is like this. So we are more likely to bound to cut the muzzle below the tumor. Whereas if we inject orally like this, <clears throat> a little away, not close to the lesion orally, the tumor will lift and the submucosal cushion, the incision angle, everything is parallel to the tumor. So the line of dissection will be in the submucosa and not going towards the muscul muscularis layer. And when injecting, stay away from at least one centimeter away from the lesion's margin. And choose a submucosal dissection plane uh, at a depth of at least uh, uh, one half or three fourth distance from the mucosa. We're not very close to the mus muscularis uh, proprial layer, not close to the mucosal also. It can be 50% in between or little below. The traction can be applied to one edge of the lesion using an online thread that 
we can attach a hemo clip uh, using a, uh, to the edge of the lesion and the hemo clip will be prior attached to a nylon thread we can pull the thread from outside and we can give traction to the lesion so that the submucosa is well uh, well exposed and the dissection can be easily done and there is another clip called so clip which can be used to give traction as well pocket creation method is different from a conventional est method which is very useful at least in the beginning part of the est career we create only a 1 mm in 1 cm incision use a pocket of a submucosal dissection below the entire tumor after the entire uh, tumor submucosal dissection is over only then start cutting the peripheries like this and then remove on them because by this method the stability of the scope is uh, very good we can do the esophageal uh, sorry we, we can do the submucosal dissection in a better way hemostasis control is good scope control is good so this is the dissection plane in nest see this is the muscularis layer and this is the vishnu vishnu sum up quickly now uh, we are running uh, short of time okay i think i am done so this choose this as the dissection plane an effective esd point is to have an on block resection a training will be to observe train in an extrave model and then go to live animal model and then only train on the patient choose a gastric antrum case first or a rectum case first and choose a biopsy proven case to do the case easily this is one of the live animal uh, workshop we do before starting our uh, practice on patient the pig being intubated and we doing the case now we can see that the vascular see everything is well seen so esd cases are uh, they can be simulated as we do it in a patient and then the pig is also alive at the end of the procedure is also quite a good thing thank you thanks vishnu palni any comments uh can i uh, dr upal can i just come in dr mohan prasad here Uh, yes sir yes sir yeah i have one comment Brilliant, sir. like uh, hi vishnu that was wonderful i'm so happy that uh, at least a uh, few of uh, our youngsters have taken up uh, emr and est uh, great demonstration and uh, just one uh, you know observation is that you wanted to leave a raw area as such uh, one thing that can help is uh, spraying collagen endoscopic collagen spray helps and in fact uh, we have been doing an all emr esds for the past uh, decade or so and uh, you know like uh, this has been followed by uh, uh, matthew philip also in all his cases of emr est so we don't uh, encounter bleeds so if you don't want to do a clip closure you can just quickly spray collagen and come that is yeah. one comment i just wanted to give you yeah i always wanted to try it and try to try so good, good job we are proud of you alni anything you want to comment yeah uh, vishnu it was a very good demonstration I mean, uh, Ubal, what I think is, uh, uh, now the time has come that uh, beyond uh, ERCP and EU, uh, EUS, now the time has come that people have to climb upon on this modality. All the youngsters like Vishnu, they have to learn the basics more than looking at big cases or the very big tumors being removed uh, in the East Africa stomach, colon and all. I think they have, they have to build more on the basics, how to do... magnificate endoscopy chroma endoscopy and how to handle the scope how to do the movements because it's almost like a single handed uh, surgery so uh, the climbing on this modality by gaining the basics is more important i think we have to more, have more and more classes on that rather than i mean uh, looking at more cases as such as he demonstrated nicely that uh, how to see the ipcl and which are the cases to avoid and what are the sites to start with uh, that's what i think uh, probably we should focus more because i am sure that we are going to have more and more of colonic polyps which are all uh, non granular granular flat laterally spreading tumors more in the rectum we have to master this technique at the earliest step, more specifically towards the youngsters obal i think you agree on that sure sure i think magesh is also in the audience i think he will be uh, also addressing on that uh, so we'll move on to the next case palli yeah true yeah. thank you Thanks, Vishnu. Go to uh, Sims. Uh. Am I more audible, sir? Yeah, you're audible. Uh, please share your screen. Yeah. Are the slides visible, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am a first year resident from medical uh, gastroenterology in the Sims Hospital. Uh, I'll be speaking about uh, an unusual presentation of a common case. so uh, i'll i'll be speaking about the following uh, in the following way uh, first i'll be uh, telling about the case history 
uh, and the investigations that we did in the case, uh, the treatment options for the case and uh, the uh, review of literature and discussion about it and what uh, the uh, learning points about it. So uh, going ahead, uh, a 78 year old male was brought to our emergency room with the complaints of generalized weakness and easy fatigability for 15 days, uh, black colored stools for one day and coffee colored vomiting for two hours. So stools were tarry black, two episodes in last one day, semi-solid, foul smelling, small in quantity. Uh, vomitus was coffee colored, one episode, approximately 200 ml, not associated with excessive retching. There was no history of abdominal pain, jaundice, altered sensorium, uh, pedal edema, abdominal distension, loss of consciousness, early satiety or weight loss, fever or diarrhea. He was a known diabetic and a known uh, patient of coronary artery disease, underwent uh, PTC in 2018 and he was on antiplatelets for the same. On examination in the emergency room, his, he was tachycardic with heart rate of 120 beats per minute. His blood pressure was 120 bar 70. Uh, pallor was present. Uh, on systemic examination, uh, the per abdominal and other systemic examination were normal. Uh, on a per rectal examination, malignant stools were uh, felt on the fingers. Uh, on, gen on the routine investigations and in the CBC, hemoglobin was low of 5.2. Uh, platelets uh, was 3 lakh 14,000. Uh, counts were elevated 17,800. Uh, LFT bilirubin was normal, but albumin was 2.2. Globulin was 1.7. Uh, electrolyte sodium was 132, potassium was high 5.2, creatine is normal, INR was 1.48. So uh, based on the history, we kept as a differential diagnosis of uh, 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 peptic ulcer disease because he was on dual antiplatelets. Uh, second, uh, second of all, he was diabetic, so maybe uh, we kept a diagnosis, a differential of uh, NFLD-related variceal bleed or maybe upper GI malignancy. So uh, we did a CT abdominal with uh, IV contrast which showed an eccentric, irregular wall thickening invol uh, involving the medial aspect of the D1 with loss of flat, uh, fat plane with the transverse colon. Uh, the circumferential mural thickening in the proximal transverse colon, uh, which is seen adherent to the D1 segment of the duodenum. We went ahead and uh, uh, did an upper GI endoscopy. Uh, the, there is a small video which shows it. Uh, it showed, uh, while coming from the duodenum, it showed a second opening, a fistulous tract uh, just above the antrum. So in, in this picture, we can see the green arrow shows the uh, uh, opening of the antrum, while the red arrow shows the fistulous opening. We pass the scope through the fistulous opening, uh, uh, which shows some uh, ex uh, deep ulcers in it. Biopsies were taken from the same. We uh, did a colonoscopy in the same patient, which showed a ulcer proliferative friable growth uh, in the hepatic flexure. The, uh, the scope uh, could be passed beyond the uh, tumor, and the biopsies were taken from the same. So the biopsies from the hepatic flexure growth showed moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma with mucinous features. Uh, the treatment uh, was followed by four units of packed uh, red blood trans, uh, transfusion. Uh, surgical gastroenterologist referral uh, was done and he was uh, posted for extended right hemicolectomy plus uh, distal gastrectomy. So this shows the intraoperative images and the biopsy findings, which shows a large 17 by 12 uh, by 2.5 centimeter tumor, which was directly invading the stomach. It was moderately differentiated mucinous adenocarcinoma. Uh, the resected margins were free of tumor. Uh, the 21 pericolic lymph nodes were free of tumor. Coming to a second case, a uh, 60 years old female presented to her OPD with complaints of pain in abdomen and loss of appetite of 10 days. Pain was insidious in onset, persistent, diffuse, dull aching type, non radiating with no aggravating or relieving factors. Uh, history of significant weight loss of 10 kgs in the last three months. There was no history of vomiting, altered bowel habits, hematemesis, melina, jaundice, burning maturation, or fever. Past medical history was not significant. On examination, only pallor was present. Apart from that, all the systemic examination were normal. On uh, routine investigations, uh, she was found to be anemic with hemoglobin of 5.1. Uh, LFTs where uh, albumin was low. Uh, renal function test was normal. So we uh, kept a differential diagnosis of upper GI malignancy because he, uh, she presented with anemia with uh, features of easy fatigability and abdominal pain. Uh, we did a CT abdomen with oral contrast. Uh, There's a small video showing it. The oral uh, contrast can be seen in the abdomen. Uh, going ahead in the duodenum, uh, going ahead in the antrum and in the duodenum. 
uh, while there we, uh, we can notice a large mass uh, seen in the area so there was a large heterogeneity enhancing exophytic lesion in the paradudinal space which measured 8 point uh, around 8 cm by 10 cm it, it was seen infiltrating the antrum of the stomach medially transverse colon anteriorly and hepatic flexure and ascending colon laterally so uh, the the uh, idea of oral contrast was to find uh, any fistulous tract uh, even in the uh, lateral position the fistulous tract was not visible but there was a suspicion of the fistulous tract so we uh, go, uh, went ahead and uh, did a upper gi endoscopy uh, which showed a fistulous tract in the d1 segment so there was a prol proliferative fibril growth with a fistulous opening in the duodenum we took the biopsies from the same biopsy showed moderate uh, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma from the duodenal mass so two units packed red blood cell transfusion was given but the patient was discharged on request due to financial constraints coming to the discussion part so uh, we are looking at two uh, patients who are presented with uh, presented to us with a gastrocolic fistula so gastrocolic fistula is an abnormal communication between a segment of large bowel which is usually a distal large bowel with a portion of stomach most commonly greater curvature uh, these uh, the fistulas are common in this area because the greater curvature of the stomach and the large bowel is separated only by a thin rim of gastrocolic momentum. So uh, the first uh, 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 first evidence of the direct communication between the colon and the stomach was observed in 1775 by Heller. Uh, Ego von Koch noticed 70 cases of carcinoma of the colon and stomach, which had progressed to the formation of gastrocolic fistula. Uh, Howdick reported the first gastrocolic fistula, secondary to carcinoma of the stomach. So coming to the pathophysiology, so any type of intra-abdominal inflammatory process leading to adhesions between the stomach and the colon can predispose to fistula formation. So a tumor may invade directly across the gastrocolic momentum or a ulcer may provoke a surrounding inflammatory peritoneal reaction leading to adherence and fistulization between the two organs. Malignant gastrocolic fistula are generally large infiltrated tumors with surrounding inflammatory reaction. Uh, symptomatology of the gastrocolic fistula patient will have water and electrolyte loss uh, due to uh, persistent diarrhea. There will be malnutrition. Metabolic uh, disorders will be due to the uh, vitamin deficient insufficiency, uh, especially uh, fat soluble vitamins. Uh, patient may have sepsis or multi organ failure syndrome, or patient may have a septic emboli. Mm -hmm. The classic triad of the symptoms in a gastrocolic fistula is diarrhea, weight loss, and stercorous breath or fecal vomiting. Uh, there may be undigested food particles in the stools. Uh, fistula due to malignancy is generally associated with abdominal pain, anorexia, weight loss. Where frequent laboratory findings may have anemia, leukocytosis, electrolyte disturbances, and hypolipidemia. So the main cause of gastrocolic fistula, if we see a neoplastic etiology, it will be colon cancer or a gastric cancer, gastric lymphoma. In infections, tuberculosis and syphilis may present with gastrocolic fistula. Uh, NSAID abuse in the past uh, leads to peptic ulcer and which may present a gastrocolic fistula again as uh, being presented by Dr. Praveen, it is rare nowadays. Uh, medications uh, uh, apart from NSAIDs like steroids may present with a gastrocolic fistula. Uh, Crohn's disease, post-surgical and trauma may also present with gastrocolic fistula. So uh, as rightly said in the discussion part, uh, the barium enema has more sensitivity than the barium meal. Uh, so it's more reliable uh, for diagnosis of gastrocolic fistula because the barium enema is given under pressure. So it is more, more there are more chances of the enema uh, tracking down the fistula tract. So endoscopy can diagnose but has higher miss rate because of the folds or colonic host rate. Uh, CT scan has uh, the uh, has uh, use in the staging and preoperative planning. If you see at the treatment, uh, surgical treatment that is en bloc dissection is the mainstay. There are apart from, apart from the surgical uh, treatment, there are uh, some uh, treatment modalities that have been uh, mentioned in the literature. For example, in over the clip method, in the patients who are not uh, uh, who are not fit for the surgery, uh, the gastrocolic fistula closure with human fibrin sealant by gastroscopic uh, approach has also uh, been mentioned. Uh, a covered colonic stent was placed in one patient for palliative uh, care, while a cardiac septal device was also tried for closing the gastrocolic fistula. So the learning points of the talk will be that the gastrocolic fistula is a rare complication of colonic adenocarcinoma. The most common location of the fistula is between the distal transverse colon and the greater curvature of the stomach. So if associated with the malignancy, it represents an advanced stage and a poor prognosis with median survival of 23 months. 
uh, in the north american uh, patient the colonic adenocarcinomas are more prone for uh, forming a gastrocolic fistula while in japan and asian countries the gastric cancer is more prone for forming a gastrocolic fistula fecal vomiting in the absence of obstructive symptoms is, the, is pathognomonic uh, eruption of foul gas is the rule but may escape the attention of the patient or the physician so uh, the patient may present with unusual symptoms as it did in our, in our patients the patient didn't had any symptoms of constipation the patient didn't had uh, any other symptoms of diarrhea or uh, 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 malnutrition so the patient presented basically with upper gi bleed symptoms or anemia ct and iv and oral contrast is a useful modality to define the tract thank you thank you i think dr jayanathan is not able to join i think it is almost similar to the first case uh, dr ganesh are you are there Um, I'm, there. I'm there. Yeah, yeah, nothing. Go ahead. Sir, any because Ganesh, no, no, no. I think only it... only one simple suggestion for people in the corporate hospital. Such interesting cases and difficult cases because of financial constraint. Don't just leave them alone. Like our friends, yes. there are three medical colleges right in the city with so many postgraduates there. They will be too eager to. Take those patients. See, of course, they can do the job. This is only an observation. What I am trying to say. It's an interesting case. The follow-up is not there. Suppose the patient has gone to G H or Stanley or uh, D D S T. They would have followed the entire case. The continuity would have been there. Good okay. presentation, Sambi. Thank you. Sir, actually, I am Dr. Babu here, sir. We had uh, this uh, second case is a uh, what boy. We have referred. Uh, Him uh, her to cancer institute. I asked uh, people to follow, but he has not gone to the cancer institute yet. The phobia is always there. The way don't tell the I send the patient there. No way the thing. Our people are very good enough. Just go to G H. Just go to my friend is there. Give a small letter. Go on. Don't tell cancer. This and the word cancer itself will make him panic. Even if you are dealing with the cancers, I think before you come to a conclusion of treatment part of it, big centers, equally good centers, are available in the government setup, where our own professors are willing to take the case and to try to do their best. And more than anything, they are, they are learning people. You know, they have got a good case to remember for their lifetime. That's what I am trying to say. Don't uh, first send to these people, our people. Don't use the word cancer. The minute you say cancer, you'll leave. You'll have the faith down of living. Finished. My life is gone. Cancer on. Sure, no, cancer yes. have been wrong. Worry about it. Don't do that. Our researchers are there. Just send them this and this thing. With all the investigation, what you have done, you can ask your friends. All the three departments are available. Are doing a good job, and then you can always use it. You no, know? there's only a suggestion. Then be. Thanks about so you, you, your suggestion is always welcome. I think I, actually that what usually done in all the corporate. I think usually we refer to a Stanley, whichever the parent institute usually we refer wherever we came from. So Ganesh, yes, sir, you want to say? Yes, yes. I think just wanted to reiterate the uh, point that you know, the DJ fistulas are not very uncommon these days. I think we need to keep our eyes open and probably pick them up. and mostly this times these are due to probably malignancies rather than the benign causes like peptic ulcer yes thank you sir we move on to the next that is my report we have uh, uh, submitted our ibd study into into the jgh open we are waiting for the response and um, our crc study is getting ready almost uh, 28 centers are currently enter uh, enrolled we are having a launch meet on 30th monday 7:30 pm uh, mainly we are calling upon all the coordinators and the pgs of the uh, 30 institutes uh, who, dr ab will give a free brief talk on how to fill up the forms and he also uh, formulated an excel sheet 
and uh, he will share with that and how to uh, fill up the forms and uh, we will be starting from the 1st of september and thanks all the centers for eagerly coming up for this uh, our third study hopefully uh, this will go for a year and uh, hopefully the um, uh, like the first two these are also going to be a successful one and uh, world hepatitis day is uh, um, uh, that uh, theme was uh, well celebrated across all the government set up as well as the private centers ddst stanley um, mmc and uh, ramchandra apollo and um, uh, chennai medical college everywhere the enthusiasm was there and uh, uh, they have sent all the details and i sent it across to the well hepatitis alliance as well as uh, wgo and uh, our midterm meeting will be in the next month and the salem people is uh, uh, organizing the meet uh, this a uh, one full day on sunday and uh, the details of the uh, meeting will follow soon and uh, coming to this today's cme that um, um, i i called dr mayesh kumar going for the last few months uh, suddenly, suddenly we got the, his appointment this month uh, he's a president of isg elect and uh, you know all he's a, one of the a famous endoscopist and gastroenterologist in this part of the world and uh, i request our chairpersons uh, to take over the session i request call upon the chairperson dr biji mohan prasad dr ganesh dr arvind and dr uh, kandasamy to take over the proceedings thank you dr biji am can you do the honors for introducing yeah, sorry, dr ganesh ji thank you so much it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, you know one of my very close friends and uh, a doyen in the field of endoscopy in india with sustained interest and is not only been been a good endoscopist but also has nurtured the endoscopy society of india so you know right from uh, the toddler stage to an adult stage and now to the phd stage not only that he is also you know a, a governor of the american college of gastroenterology a man with a lot of hard work i i don't think his clock ever has uh, 24 hours i guess it should be more than 24 hours because he is there into research he is there into all uh, consortium meetings he is there in guideline meetings he is there publishing he is also the editor and uh, what not and also the president of uh, indian society of gastroenterology so lot of uh, laurels and honors so uh, i'm so happy to uh, you know welcome uh, mahesh uh, kumar goenka to this audience and uh, introducing him uh, with the bio data is like carrying coal to newcastle or carrying uh, you know cotton to coimbatore so i don't think that is the right thing to do so uh, over to uh, uh, mahesh for his uh, delivery of the talk and it's a, it's a very important talk because he is going to speak on endoscopy uh you know which is uh, you know the heartthrob of all the youngsters today you know more than uh, you know people like uh, madhura gopal and my teacher used to say don't look at the patient through the hole look at him as a whole w h o l e so but today everybody wants to look at the patient through the hole all the youngsters uh, you know get carried away by endoscopy i'm sure uh, the lot of exciting things happening in the field of endoscopy so we need to have some balance and we need to have a, a proper training before we move on to do all the procedures so over to mahesh uh, without wasting uh, your time so uh, please go ahead mahesh please share your uh, thoughts good evening uh, everybody uh, am i audible yeah very well yes thank you um, to the indian society of gastroenterology tamil nadu chapter but to the president dr ubal ubal and the secretary dr prem kumar my uh, uh, respect to the chairpersons of this uh, session uh, when your friend like vijay mohan prashad is introducing you um, it's very embarrassing because uh, he speaks a lot of things which i am not sure whether i deserve them or not but i have worked with him and i have seen the passion in his uh, work of in the field of gastroenterology both as an academician research as well as a organizer uh, i am very happy uh, to be a part of this meeting i could attend the last two or three presentations they are uh, international standard presentation the esd talk the unusual manifestation uh, unusual cause of gi bleed and very very wise words uh, by the senior uh, gastroenterologist who are here and i can see 
that in this meeting we have a very very senior people who are very experienced uh, wise people as well as very young dynamic uh, people being a part of the meeting so when uh, dr ubal asked me to uh, speak on this topic i uh, just was a little um, confused as to what should i talk this uh, uh, next 35 40 minutes is not going to be talking about advanced endoscopy which we have heard in the last half an hour uh and we are not going to talk about unusual cases this is a comprehensive um, perspective of a responsible endoscopy so i think while it is uh, really interesting that uh, endoscopy is advancing uh, one of the one of the branches which is advancing very fast and i think there's if there is any other branch which can compete with us it's only the cardiology otherwise i think we are one of the leading branch and it's a very very happy um, thought process however i think uh, somewhere uh, sometime we forget that we need to be responsible also so most of the what i'm going to talk today is already known to all of you both to the youngsters as well as the senior people but i thought i would put them in a comprehensive way and would want a, a small discussion if possible after the presentation so uh, i uh, when uh, we decided about this talk about uh, two weeks back uh, i went to the pubmed and search is there anything available on endoscopist and responsibility and i found about 102 articles which have looked at the various responsibility of the endoscopist in various uh, spheres of endoscopy and i uh, went through some of these uh, to come to prepare this talk now so what i have broadly divided my talk into what are the responsibility of an endoscopist before the procedure during the procedure after the procedure as well as a very important component uh, which uh, the seniors would agree in the teaching the students sometimes nowadays we learn from the students because some of the students are learning faster than we ever did in our career uh, so um, when you talk of uh, responsibility of an endoscopist before the procedure i think there are five important bullet points what is the indication of the procedure what is the contraindication do we, do you have the availability of in terms of expertise and instruments how do you prepare the patient do you admit the patient and what about an informed consent so let me first talk about uh, indication and contraindication this is from my um, collection i think it's almost 15 years back that this individual who was presented to us with cholestatic jaundice of one month uh, hemogram was normal bilirubin was 8.3 mg and alkaline phosphate was markedly elevated the ultrasound showed dilated ihbr and cbd and mildly dilated pd and then we did a ct scan and it showed that there was a dilated system both the bile duct as well as intrahepatic bile radicals and there was a mass in the duodenum as you can see here which was projecting to the duodenal lumen we also did an mri to uh, assess the tumor and this again clearly showed that there was something obstructing the lower end so we did a side wing endoscopy and this is what we found this 2007 as you can see that there is a large polypoidal mass in the ampulla so the obvious question to a gastroenterologist or if i can say to the endoscopist would be and this was low grade adenocarcinoma that whether you should put a plastic biliary stent you should put a metal biliary stent to do a nasobiliary drainage do a sphincterotomy or none of them i think uh, the answer uh, most of you would agree that uh, there is no indication of any intervention in this patient and the answer should be none of them this patient should be straightforward handed over to the surgeons to do a people's procedure now so uh, over a period of time and this was realized uh, way back almost about 40 years back that it has become a barber chair phenomenon and whatever we talk we often come across patients where procedures like biliary stenting has been done without putting a thought into the process so it's becoming like a somebody say in a barber chair will have a haircut i think we have to prevent that in our practice so have your indications very clear and this is again a very old study from peter cotton we all know is the father of ercp and he uh, in his article almost 15 years back talked about ercp loss suites and he said that uh, it's a complications like pancreatitis sphincterotomy perforation infection esophageal perforation all these complications can lead to uh, ercp related medical legal suites and one of the important aspect is indications where the indication is not clear i think uh, you see the 32 had primary issue of medical legal case was indication so i think it's very very difficult to protect yourself in a uh, medical legal issues if your prcp indication for that matter indication of any of the procedures which you do is not standardized not following the guidelines whether it's international national or local guidelines and uh, we always talk about evidence based medicine but we know that even a broken clock will be sometimes at least twice in 24 hours will be correct we tell you 
uh, six, uh, six hours and 15 minutes. And so while evidence-based medicine is important, we must, must understand the limitation of evidence-based medicine. And this was interesting a uh, long time back, the BMJ take out, took out this article which said, while we all understand that the parachutes are very important uh, tools to save yourself when you're driving, uh, but then there's no proven randomized controlled trial. So while uh, we, uh, we uh, must look for a randomized controlled trial, I think we have to put our own intelligence to um, go ahead with the procedure or not to go ahead with the procedure. Now, this is another patient and I want to uh, share with, because I can see some dynamic, uh, very, very uh, advanced endoscopist in the gathering today. So this patient had hyalur cholangiocarcinoma, almost a type three uh, or a type four hyalur cholangiocarcinoma. And you see that there are segregated ducts on the right ductal system and the left ductal system and CT guided FNAC from the hyalur mass rose and adenocarcinoma. Patient had adrenal metastasis. So all we were looking for was palliation. Now, ideally you would all agree that we would put two metal stents in this situation. But somehow if it fails, then what I see nowadays is that people are so keen to tackle everything by advanced techniques that you will do an EUS. And if you have the expertise, you may put a stent on the left ductal system from the stomach and the right ductal system from the duodenum. In fact, I was attending the APDW uh, meeting today and they showed some of the cases where this has been done in, as, as in a situation of failed ERC. I think this is taking science too far. Now, this is an article which has been published in this respect, respect only last year in endoscopy. And they had two arms for advanced hyalur cancers. One arm had combination of ERCP. So they put a stent through the ERCP with additional stents being put through the US, either through the stomach or through the duodenum. You can see that from the first part of the duodenum to the right ductal system, another stent has been placed. So this is uh, one arm. And the other arm uh, was a bilateral transhepatic biliary drainage. And the authors were very happy to report. I was surprised that this article was published in a journal of high impact factor like endoscopy. And it showed that uh, recurrent biliary obstruction, biliary reintervention, the first arm, which is ERCP plus EUS arm, scored over the PTBD uh, arm. And so they concluded that even for advanced hyalur malignancies, it's an endoscopist who should tackle it in whatever way you can. I totally disagree with this uh, article. And I reviewed this article in great detail. There are hardly, uh, th hardly 36 cases. The two cases were dropped out from the first. And if you include those as intention of treat analysis, then the results will be possibly in favor of PDBD. More importantly, they compared 10 millimeter endoscopic stent either through the EUS or through the ERCP with 2.5 millimeter eight French PTBD catheters. And they came to the conclusion that yeah, ERCP plus EUS is a better way of tackling than PTBD. I think this is absolutely wrong and uh, one should not compare apple with oranges. So if you get a data like this, I think it's our time that we should not forget that there are other methods of treating these patients, which may be less invasive, less costly with equivalent or sometimes better results. So what may be possible is not always desirable. So I would, I would emphasize on this point, let's not care, get carried away by some of these articles uh, just because they are published in some good journal and think that this is the best way of dealing, dealing with it. Now, and this is again a, a meta-analysis published about four or five years back, which looked at advanced hyalur strictures, uh, seven studies, five six patients, and said that PTBD was more successful than ERCP. Adverse event were same, 32 mortality was same, and quality of life was possibly better, at least in one study. So I think uh, the point of, um, point of mentioning all these is that while we uh, think that we should try to tackle everything by endoscopy because that's our domain, we should not forget that sometimes our colleagues in the other departments can tackle it better way than what we can. And that's a responsibility of endoscopists. Now let's also talk about availability of expertise. So this is a, a almost a 20 years old case I picked up. This was again a hyalur cholangiocarcinoma and see what the endoscopist has done. He has put a single pigtail stent in the left hepatic duct. This patient presents to us uh, within 48 hours after the procedure with cholangitis, septicemia, and shock. I think this is something which we must not uh, agree to. We must um, not justify these techniques. And I think uh, we have advanced in the last 15 to years not to do this, but you still get cases where in order to have an experience, some people would only do an ERCP and do whatever is possible with their expertise. I think this is something 
which is to be avoided. And the basic principle is that if you cannot do any good, do not do any harm to the patient. Now, while you are preparing the patient, I think one issue which we will be increasingly facing because of the uh, cardiac and the cerebral reasons for the patients being uh, on antiplatelet and anticoagulation is that we must have a clear understanding of how to tackle these patients. And we know now there are good literature available and uh, there are guidelines from the international bodies which are available, which has divided the procedures as low risk and high risk. And then depending on the low risk procedure, these uh, uh, such as diagnostic procedure, biliary append extending without sphincterotomy, you can carry on with these antiplatelet drugs. Well, for high risk procedure like polypectomy, ampelectomy, MR, ESD, which we just saw a beautiful demonstration by Dr. Vishnu, you need to look at whether this is a low risk condition for starting the antiplatelet or high risk condition for starting the antiplatelet. So if there's a coronary arterial stent which has been placed in less than one year, drug eluting stent, then you must discuss with the cardiologist before you do the procedure. Whereas if there's a low risk condition for starting, then you should stop antiplatelet drugs five days before the procedure. However, the present knowledge says that equal sprint can be continued. Similarly, for anticoagulation, if uh, you are doing a low-risk procedure and the patient has a warfarin, you check the INR and then stop the, uh, stop the warfarin five days before the procedure. For directly acting oral anticoagulation, you omit the drug only in the morning of the procedure. And similarly, there are guidelines for the high-risk procedures for anticoagulation. Now, informed consent, I, I think uh, uh, I being involved with the with the various societies of Indian Society of Gastroenterology and Endoscopic Society of India, cannot say that this is very important component. Judges don't understand much when they have informed consent. In fact, I was surprised about six months back, I think it was in Delhi or Mumbai, that one of the medical legal suit ultimately resulted in a 10 lakh being paid by the medical facility, including the doctor, for not giving an informed, proper, using a proper informed consent. And the judge has an, uh, a, a noting that you cannot have a printed informed consent. Uh, that they are the, Everything was printed, that uh, ERCP can lead to pancreatitis, cholangitis, and so on. So I think there are certain columns which we need to fill in front of the patients, uh, which would mean that we are talking of an informed consent and not a blind consent. So I think we need to explain the nature and correct of the procedure, indication, likely benefits, risk and complication, and alternative procedures, just like I talked to you about. No consent is criminal. And I think in our country, it's very difficult to get an informed refusal. If you want to do an ERCP on an individual and the relatives refuse, I have failed many a time to even get them a sign that they are not agreeable to that refusal. They'll say that I'm not agreeable and I will not sign. So that's a very important negative aspect. And I think an informed refusal is equally important as informed consent is. So while I was the secretary of SGI, we, with the help of some legal authority, formed certain consent form. I don't know whether they are available on the site now or not, but this was prepared after talking to some of the judges of the high court. And uh, I think the informed consent is a very, very important component. Now let's move from the pre-procedure to during the procedure. I think two most important, uh, three most important aspects are avoiding infection, measures to prevent complications and monitoring. So I think I would spend about three or four minutes on avoiding infection. I think this is one, you would all agree that this is one area because it doesn't get exposed to the patient or the relatives. We are not comfortable spending money on the resources on avoiding the infection and having the uh, internationally accepted disinfection process in our system. Now, uh, endoscopic reprocessing is so important. Accessories reusability is so important. And of course, the universal precaution. Now, this is a picture of uh, uh, you, you know that this gentleman from uh, Sung, Chung, Sung from uh, Joseph Sung from Hong Kong, and this is a, maybe a cartoon, but it's how he can perform an endoscopy 20 years back. But now, if you need to do an endoscopy, you need to be well prepared, particularly in the COVID time. Now, while the infections transmitted from GI endoscopy are not common, they are related to the complexity of the procedure. The complexity of the procedures, which we just heard uh, uh, from some of you, uh, are advanced procedure, and they are also prone to more infections. These are some of the known infections. Previously, Salmonella was common, but now Pseudomonas, H. pylori. And we all have been talking for the last few years about carbapenem resistant enterocracy and strong eloides. Fortunately, these infections, Mycobacterium, Prostridium difficile, Hepatitis B, C, HIV, and fungi are uncommon or not known. Uh, this is a very old age slide, Spalding classification. We will divide uh, instruments into critical, semi-critical, and non-critical. Critical are those which penetrate the skin or the mucosal cavity, requires sterilization. Semi-critical are those who do not penetrate the skin and mucosa and high-level disinfection. 
which does not take care of the spores is good enough and endoscopes will fall into this, whereas endoscopic excesses will fall in the sterilization group. Now, whether to use manual or automatic reprocess, I think both are good. But then whether you follow the guideline while using these reprocessor is what is important. I think you need to have manual cleaning as an essential part of the disinfection or reprocessing system and exposure to disinfectant is important in both the modalities. So if you have a small number of procedures, maybe the manual is okay, but for large number of procedure, I think automatic reprocessors is what is desirable. So this is our uh, endoscopy reprocessing room. Uh, so they are initially brought in after the initial cleaning in the endoscopy room itself. Then on the table, uh, the work is done and then manual cleaning is done from the various things. And after that, we put them in the reprocessing units and then finally hang them in dedicated hangers. Now, impact of aerotic disinfection process, this is really uh, uh, very horrible pictures of the endoscopes if they are not handled properly due to the disinfection process. So I think one thing which we must, if we are not doing uh, as a responsible endoscopist must do is that you should have a periodic endoscope culture from your endoscope and from the various components of the endoscope, you should collect the samples and then look at the organism. So some of the high concern organisms, even one colony is dangerous, is gram-negative bacilli, staphorias, and trococci. And the low concern organism are coagulase, negative and bacillus and diphtheroids. Now disposable cap, I'm sure some of you have used them and we have been using it for quite some time now, is a good alternative to avoid disinfection because of the elevated area in the duodenoscope. And this is a relatively economical way that cost about 1,000 rupees to 4,000 rupees per uh, cap. And this may reduce the infection rate a lot. Disposable duodenoscope we always talk about and we had uh, experience of a couple of cases uh, a couple of months back. However, I think for our country, it's a non-starter and uh, they look very fashionable but till the cost comes down significantly, I don't think we will be able to use it routinely. Unfortunately, there are hardly any disinfection guidelines, no national guidelines, no regulatory bodies, no hospital policies, and mostly that we have no departmental policy. We tried to form a position paper from the SGI, which was published. I would say that we as society, even a chapter, uh, Tamil Nadu chapter, I saw three of the studies which you are talking about, must have some policy which has to be put forward. Now, our hospital is a JCI accredited hospital. So we have a policy which is in place, both for the endoscope as well as for the accessories. And I will briefly talk about it. Now, so accessories, some of the accessories, mostly from Olympus companies are reusable, but most of the other companies and also Olympus, some of the accessories are devised for single use. And this is again, a major area for medical legal issues. Imagine that if your patient comes to know that you're using a single use accessories again and again without taking his permission. And uh, Dr. Nageshwari uh, asked me not to discuss this many a time. He says, what you're discussing is dangerous if uh, people come to know about is that single use accessories being used multiple times can be a big medical legal issues uh, besides reducing the efficacy and increasing the risk of infection. Now let's look at the cost of single use devices. Now, if you have to do a simple ERCP with a guide wire and extractable balloon and a sphincter tone, the three together will cost about 26,000 rupees. Forget about lithotripsy basket and other things, which you may require in a given case. So three accessories itself will cost 26,000 rupees and that will make our uh, ERCP is prohibitive. So we in our hospital have chosen some areas where we don't use a reusable, uh, single use accessory reusable and biopsy for set is one of them, but then the question comes that when you collect biopsy forceps like this, within a week to 10 days, the disposal becomes a huge problem. This is a pollution in the atmosphere uh, for disposing these instruments. So we all understand the advantages and disadvantages of using accessories. So you must have a balance and you must remember that there's a medical legal aspect of this. So what JCI has done is that JCI asked us that in the department, you should have a written policy that any accessory which you are reusing, how many uses you would allow. They said you cannot use a sphincterotom um, till it breaks, but you should have an, uh, your own policy that you're going to use it six times or seven times. And if it is functioning, you will uh, discard in spite of its functioning after six or seven times. So as this is what I'm saying that you must have a policy for reuse of accessories. I'm not going to details of the steps of reprocessing and uh, reusable accessories, but we must follow that. What about endogenous infection? Uh, infections do not come with the, uh, with the, from outside, from patient to patient, but can come from your own interior. And antibiotics are recommended this time in these situations, diverticulitis, cholangitis, before preg, 
ERCP with unrelieved obstruction, USN, FNA, FNA of cystic lesion, GI bleed in cirrhotics, and severely neutropic in patients. But it's generally not recommended for infective endocarditis, non cardiac vas vascular grafts, and for joint processes. I think what we forget in our practice is that. Uh, what we forget in our practice is risk from the patient to the healthcare workers. I think this is also, if you are in charge of an endoscopy unit, this is also a responsibility that our colleagues should not get infected from the patient. And this has become even important in the recent COVID pandemic, that we were always worried and we wanted to take care for COVID transmission from the patient to the healthcare workers. And the precautions uh, would be a general precaution, use of PPEs and vaccination wherever possible. I'm not going to talk details about sedation, but I think we have moved a lot. I remember my PGI uh, MER days about 25 years, 27 years back, when we will do an ERCP with minimal uh, use of sedation or anxiolysis. We have moved from that to conscious sedation, deep sedation, and even general anesthesia. So I think there's a, uh, there's a paradigm shift in that. We must, as an endoscopist, understand what are the various sedative agents uh, which can be used. And a lot of hospitals in the country are still using a combination of benzodiazepines with opioids. And that has the advantage of the various properties of sedation. But in our place, we are now almost totally shifted to propofol. And we, have, we find it to be very, very safe um, sedation. Now, the question is that who should be monitoring the sedation? Now, on one end of the spectrum is endoscopist himself. And the other end is a specialized anesthetist present in the endoscopy room. I think you can have, again, a policy but in general, for a low risk simple procedure like an upper J endoscopy without comorbidities, endoscopist himself should be authorized to do the sedation. Whereas for high risk complex procedure, anesthetist is always welcome. Monitoring, this is the minimal essential monitoring which is required, a pulse oximeter. But then if you are doing advanced procedures such as POEM, you must have a carbon dioxide retention and tidal PCO2, which is so important. And often during the POEM, we have to stop the procedure if the PCO2 goes and and uh, carbon dioxide goes beyond 40. So we stop the procedure, wait for some time, and then again, start the procedure. Now, so uh, we talked about infection and monitoring. What about complications? Complications are, will happen. So the philosophy is that not recognizing complications. I think that is the most important thing. I still, after having practiced ERCP for almost 25 years, at the end of the procedure, always look for a kidney shadow. Whatever simple or complicated procedure this may have been, and my, uh, my uh, fellows, they often say, think that I'm, what, what, what am I looking for? And uh, the procedure is over and you should come out. But I think waiting for a couple of seconds to look for air shadow around the kidney is very important. So worst thing is to hide the complication. And the worst would be to say that we, we have no complication in my series. Complications will happen either because of the procedures being not done properly or not doing the standard preventive measures. And I think today, using a rectal NSAID uh, and uh, stent, pancreatic stent in difficulty RCP has become a standard of care. Now, we must also, also differentiate a complication from a sequel. Now, I remember this was possibly my first poem, which I did uh, several years back. And uh, at the end of the procedure, this is how it looked like. So there was pneumoperitoneum. And my team thought that I had done huge, huge complication but we all now know that this is more of a sequelae than a complication of poem, and we must differentiate and understand the natural history uh, in an individual case. Now, of course, uh, as I was saying that you must look for kidney shadow at the end of any complicated ERCP, and this is one such example, and then if required, do a CT scan and to look, look, look for the diagnosis. I think diagnosing a complication the earliest is the most important thing. Sometimes it has happened that uh, you discharge the patient within a few hours and the patient then develops complication at home and comes back to you in a septicemic situation. And that can lead to a huge problem. Now, uh, not to panic is important. Um, this is, an, I think, an ERCP, which I was performing a couple of years back. And while I was trying to pull out a large stone, this is what I caused, a large tear in the lateral wall of the second part of the duodenum. But if you don't lose your pool and if you have the tools and experience, then you can control the situation. So I went ahead with the Ovesco clip and could target that area, though it was a large area of almost about 1.82 centimeter in size, and could uh, effectively close this perforation. And the ERCP procedure was then completed in the next sitting after a few days. But I think if you have the expertise, then you, can, you need, not, uh, need not panic in any situation. What to do if no success? I think you do something different, change the accessory, change hands, postpone to a later date, look for alternative methods, and refer to a more experienced person. 
This is one such example, I think 2003 again, and I was doing an ERCP and the mechanical detector, this was trapezoid in this case, uh, let me go back, uh, trapezoid in this case did not function. So uh, I was stuck, the basket will not come out and the stone was there. So I could pass a thin pre-cut knife by the side of the basket and just increase the size of the sphincterotomy by a few millimeters. And uh, doing that, we could take out the stone intact, even though the trapezoid basket had become malfunctioned. And so I think uh, you have to sometimes uh, think out of the box and then complete the procedure by this technology. So lastly, let me talk about the responsibility of an endoscopist after the procedure. I think the monitoring does not end after you've completed your procedure, particularly when you've completed your advanced procedure. The question is that how long are you responsible for a case? And there, the court says that once established, the physician-patient relationship continues until officially and appropriately terminated by the patient or the physician. So I think if the patient leaves your place and develop, develops a complication after two days, you cannot say that uh, this patient had left my hospital and so I'm not responsible for the complication. I think this is a very important medical legal aspect. Again, this statement is by a high court judge. And so I think we should look into this, that uh, we must take care of the post-operative period. So I, th I think I'll skip some of these slides. But uh, documentation, I think, is very important. And we, when we were in PGI Chandigarh, we were taught that what is not written is not done. So if you have not documented uh, whether you have given rectal NSAID after an ERCP, uh, then uh, later on in the court or anywhere, you may say that I did it, but nobody is going to believe it. So uh, if it is not written down, it did not happen. Now, I think good, good medical care, and I would just compare two um, uh, endoscopy reports. This is an endoscopy report about a few years back. And the endoscopy report just says esophagus N, uh, stomach N, I think, suspected something. And this is all which the patient was carrying. I think we must have a detailed endoscopy report. And various societies have given that what should be the format of the endoscopy report, what are the pictures which we should give. I'm not going to go into details of this. This is by itself a chapter. So I think the last uh, couple of slides, I think uh, uh, in, a, in a forum like this, I think training must be discussed. I'm not going to go into the details of this. We must understand that today's trainee is tomorrow's trainer and today's trainer may be tomorrow's patient. So we must continue to teach our juniors. It is so important and the various technologies can be animal models when you talk about endoscopy, plastic models, simulators, but the best modality of course is being by the side of your fellow inside the endoscopy suites and then train them uh, there. I think uh, my last slide, responsibility of the endoscopist, if I have to give any take home message, it is perform the procedure only if indicated, perform it skillfully, safely, and comfortably, and follow up for appropriate time. Document properly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. It was a wonderful talk. And from a person who has been involved in endoscopic responsibilities for so many years, including medical legal. Each of your slides have been uh, very important and probably have to be imbibed by all the youngsters who are connected to this meet today. And uh, more than the guidelines, I think it is the responsibility of the endoscopist himself, whether to decide whether the intervention you are doing on this patient is going to benefit him or whether there are any other options which are probably better, which might be suitable for him. Most importantly, team approach is the way forward. Probably that is woefully lacking these days because we work as an individual unit. Most importantly, I think it is better not to walk away after the procedures, allow your residents to deal with the problems. I think you must anticipate and also look for complications after the procedure is over. And also probably ask the anesthetist whether it is now safe for you to leave the room. With this few words, I hand over the mic to the other chairpersons. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank nice you. having you here today. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mahesh, this is Dr. Palnisamy. Yes, sir. Uh, enjoyed the talk. Uh, thank you. I just want, want to make one comment. And uh, I always tell, tell the uh, trainees that they should know when to stop the procedure. Even a, a, a routine colonoscopy, one can face a problem. You may not uh, be able to proceed beyond the sigmoid. Uh, even ma ma managing all sorts of maneuvers, if you're not able to proceed, probably you should decide when to stop. 
any procedure, either simple diagnostic or even therapeutic procedure. So you should decide when to stop. That's what I want to comment. So I would like to re-emphasize this point, and this is a statement which I always tell my fellows, when, that 15 years back when I was doing an ERCP, and if you fail in a small but definite percentage of patients, you feel very bad leaving that procedure incomplete. But then when you come back to your chamber and you sit in your office, you feel relaxed that you're not done any harm to the patient. I think when you're leaving the endoscope without a complete task, it's a very, very disappointing feeling. But then within a minutes, within a few minutes, it changes to relaxed situation. And I think I cannot overemphasize on this point that don't be hankering that you have to be successful in all cases. Please leave before it is too late. And uh, about Dr. Ganesh's talk about teamwork, I think this is, this is important. I think uh, what is happening nowadays that we endoscopists, and I wanted to highlight this, is think that everything should be tackled by us. And we will find out some way of entering the duct from somewhere. We'll find from the US to enter the pancreatic duct and showcase it in a conference. I think the simplest answer, and I may look very philosophical in this, is that whether if it's one of your relatives, whether you'll go ahead and do the procedure in the way you are planned for this particular patient. And I think if that thought process crosses your mind, then you will take the right decisions because then you know the limitations, you know your advantage, and you will take a right decision as to what you should do. This may look very philosophical. Juniors don't want to hear this. They say that after you have spent your whole life, you're giving a lecture to us. Uh, but then I think this is the crux of the experience. I think there's a lot of peer pressure these days, people wanting to do so many things in such a short period of time. There are some learning curves for each of the procedures. I think we should go through that and not bypass it. This is my comment. And, and also, Ganeshi, I think uh, training uh, the trainer is of uh, paramount importance. I think Mahesh made a passing remark, uh, you know, like all trainees become trainers and then the trainers can become patients. So it is in our own selfish interest, we need to train our, uh, you know, juniors. And again, here again, many a times what happens is they just, uh, you know, many endoscopists when training, they don't do a mentorship. Mentorship is most important. You have to really stand there and fine tune their body language. Whatever mistakes they're doing, you have to correct. I think unless others we do this, we cannot create uh, uh, endoscopists uh, of with skill set at the same time taking care of patient safety. So I think this is of uh, paramount. So, one of the parameters VG we use uh, in our uh, our uh, setup is that when somebody is doing an ERCP on the CBD stone. Uh, young fellows or young consultant, I ask them often, is the gallbladder is intact or not? And believe me, half of the time they don't know. They have no idea whether the gallbladder is intact or not intact. So I think we just go ahead uh, with a very tunnel Arjun-like Arjun eyes that we have to do what we are supposed to do. I think they have, and I, this is very, very common. I mean, uh, I don't know whether I should share this, but I find it very common that 50% of the time they don't even know whether the gallbladder is intact or not intact. And what are they which is, as you said, look at the patient as a whole and not, at the, not through the hole. Retrospectively thinking. Uh, what is wonderful lecture. Thank you, sir. Thinking. Nice to see you. Retrospectively thinking. Okay. Decades back. Decades back. Only manual cleaning. One step. Finish. Next patient, please. There were medical camps where we did 100 endoscopy in a single city for about city for about three or four hours. The role of anesthetists, which was totally ignored those days, now it has come to the prime level only in the corporate hospital, if I remember. And the government hospital setup, I think, is there or not, I don't know, because I left government service long back, 20 years back. And I still remember one case, one event, I'm not ashamed of telling. One patient was lying on the uh, table and a procedure was carrying it out on endoscopy is doing. And my chief was just making a round and asked one of the guys, just find out whether the patient is alive or not. So yeah, our utter surprise, patient was dead. Can you believe? This happened about 25 to 26 years back. I am not ashamed of telling that incident because the poor availability of no ECG, I mean no monitor, nothing. 
nothing. Some of that man, you know, shrewd guy, shrewd person, still I heard a lot of regards for that man. He just came around and made a simple comment. Just find out if the patient is alive or not. He is not the person doing the endoscopy. He is not the person holding the other thing. Just making the round. So we have advanced a lot, lot, lot. Enough reaction, enough center where the workload is more like a common hospital. Are they following the same uh, thing like what is corporate hospital doing the re living position? Ingresaran, your comment. Ingresaran? I think Aravind also there, sir. Aravind. ARB, sir, please. You're not heard. Unmute. No, we, are, we will not be able to do it. Take it from me. There are so many issues there. How many Apogee endoscopies are there in the thing? Days are gone. Where we used to have only just two endoscopies in the unit and they keep doing it. And that too, when we were all students, finished. No so I would uh, tell you a very interesting story, sir, that um, about five years back, my CEO told me that, um, why don't you do a marathon endoscopy? That you start the endoscopy in the morning and carry on one after another. And we would publish that in one day, one doctor did more than 100 endoscopies. So I said, Madam, uh, I don't know whether it comes as a good news in the newspaper, but it will come as a bad news in the newspaper because you cannot do 100 cases with so many scopes and so many rooms. Anybody can do a back calculation and say that you must have compromised on the quality of endoscopy if you have done 100 cases in a few hours. So I think we have to be prospectively understand that we have limitations. So if we actually follow the rules, then in one hour, you cannot do more than four upper J endoscopies. And we must calculate it that way. And that uh, if you follow the rules, otherwise, of course, uh, dipping into a Savlon, Savlon score, scope in a Savlon and taking it out has been a practice, even in big hospitals till recently. I'm sorry to make this comment, uh, Magesh. I think way back in 1998 or so, we had a Tirupatur camp arranged endoscopy. You'll be surprised. 110 Apogee endoscopy I have done from 2 to 7 p.m. Non-stop, non-stop. Couple of my colleagues who are attending this meeting are aware. They came and asked me, Bala, can I help you? Bala, can you? That's exactly about uh, what to say. Uh, two years after I started developing this REA, with agonizing pain I was able to do, mentally I was making, let me make a switch thing. And I did it, out of which you'll be surprised about 25 biopsies were done. One girl now in the US, she was doing a PhD. She was with us. So such things is not possible in this era where uh, so much of uh, uh, medical case, this and that. Very difficult, very difficult. Anyhow, you did a wonderful job. I open up for many of the people who are uh, trying to do extraordinary things. When you are not able to do it, give it, give it to somebody else and ask him to come some different day. Thank you. So thank you everybody. And I would like to make one last comment. Um, uh, Dr. Padani, yes, yes, you have something. I just want to know, all your cases. Come again, sir. No, we are not able to still do man, uh, automatic in all patients. So what we uh, do is that we do manual in a uh, num number of cases and every day at least once the scope uh, would go through the automatic processor before the end, day end. So we have uh, fortunately on our unit about 40 endoscopes of various types and we are able to do to some extent, but I must admit here openly that we are still not even not close to the perfection. We are not close to the perfection. We may talk anything on the meetings like this, but we are not close to the perfection. 30 to 40 endoscopies in government hospitals is almost every day this happens. 30 to 40 cases. They start by 8 hours, then it goes on, goes on, goes on. So the availability of scope and the patients on the path of the paramedical people to clean it and give it, I think it's very different. Ganesh, do you agree with me? Ganesh. Yes, sir. I think now the situation is slightly much better, sir. Right. But then Good. whatever you have said is 100% true. Okay. The government setup, it may be difficult to have the guidelines 
to be followed in perfection. But in most corporate hospital also, we are not doing automatic cleaning in all the cases. Sometimes we need to probably bypass, depending upon the number of cases we have. But most of the time we try to accommodate automatic uh, disinfection. I would think at least, at least in case... Vijim, sir, one comment. Sorry, yeah, here we please go. Uh, we, we need video consent for transplant. We do video consent. If you do video consent, you uh, they we can escape because if they write, they don't understand. But if you talk them, make them understand 10 minutes, we got all every Android phones very simple. That's the point I want to make. Uh, the only issue, Dr. Wagner, is that, that the question of language will come, that they will say that you spoke a language which was not understood by the other people. So I think everything has a limitation. The video, cons video consent has a problem that the relatives may say that he spoke an English language which I did not understand. So I think, but I agree totally that for liver transplant, we do it routinely. And for complicated cases, ERCP at least, we sometimes take a video consent. And some of our rooms in the endoscopy area have a CCTV so that whatever you're talking to the people are recorded. Uh, advertently or inadvertently. Manish uh, and our friend, late Chandramohan, our surgeon, he does the everyday thing and the video kind of thing. Speaking to the people, consultation, everything you know is the video coverage. Of course, he is not going to cover the rectal examination or examining the private part <laughs> of it, but he makes it a point to make it a point everything is being recorded. Unfortunately, we lost him last year. Yeah, uh, I think it's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, like, uh, as everybody was saying, there's one surgeon at Coimbatore for the past 20 years, he used to take an informed consent for every procedure separately. He says, Whipples, okay, this is going to be the global figures of uh, complications. So these are the rates of death. These are the rates of adverse events. These are all the adverse events. It's a percentage. So he'll have to sign if the patient, attender, and that's his relative and doctor have to sign together. If they if they don't sign, he never used to operate upon them. 20 years. So in one of the corporates at Coimbatore, I know. So strict, you know, follow-up always uh, has been there. I think at least, even if we don't go to that extent, we have to be more careful. Today, in the era of medical legal uh, litigations, and, you know, in our intensive care, we take always the informed consent from the patients, attenders, relatives, uh, video consent, and everything is video recorded, like uh, we do for all research trials. But for endoscopies, it's humanly impossible to keep a video recording device and then keep recording how many would you record and maintain. It's very difficult. I think we have to strike a balance. I think Maya showed one slide where we have to strike a balance. Uh, what is optimal and what is reality? In reality, what could you do? I think uh, that is judgmental and I think uh, that has to be followed. I think Arvind has one of the largest uh, government uh, sector endoscopy units. Arvind, your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, exactly. Actually, regarding that anesthetist, we are having anesthetists on call. We have a boils apparatus inside in almost all the institutions. If we need, we call them. They, they come there. But regularly, you don't keep it, Larvin? No, no, sir, not yeah. regularly. Not yeah. regularly. But we, we call, they come immediately. So, sir, in our setup, we have uh, anesthetist always on, on call. In a multi special unit, there is a separate uh, uh, unit for anesthetist to attend the ERCP and other cases for. Kanda is still working. Anesthesia. It is 8 o'clock in the morning. Kanda. Kanta <laughs> Swami is Alayas Kumar doing an excellent yes, job. Congrats. Keep it up, Kumar. Kanta Swami. Super. Still working. Yes, still sir. working. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. So, um, if, can I make a final comment which is not related to the talk or the subject which we are talking about? Um, uh, with all uh, support from all of you, I'll be taking over as the president of Indian Society of Gastroenterology in the uh, next IUG meeting. And I was going through the list of uh, Tamil Nadu chapter. And I was surprised that about 40% of the gastroenterologists who are members of the Tamil Nadu chapter are not member of Indian Society of Gastroenterology. So it's my earnest request that that's a parent body. While you're doing excellent job as a, as a chapter, please contribute and become member of the parent body, Indian Society of Gastroenterology, which is the mother body of the uh, gastroenterologists. So I was pained to see that 40% of the Tamil Nadu gastroenterologists, qualified Tamil Nadu gastroenterologists are not member of the issue. Magesh, we will be happy if you can pass on the names of 40 guys 
who have not become a member, take it in a matter of 100 days, all those 40 people will become members of the IIG. Thank Just you, sir. Send it by mail to Dr. K. S. B. or Dr. Ubal. We'll follow it. I'm already we'll interacting with Dr. Ubal on this, and we would we would take it forward. Thank we'll you, sir. Do that. Probably they have registered here and gone elsewhere to do their practice because many of the people in the different B and DM nowadays are the majority of them from North India. The local guys are less than 20% or so. That may be one of the reasons why they registered as a PG, then they go out. That we are again going out of the subject, but what out. we have started recently, sir, is that for the first time, ISG started the fellowship of uh, for the rather than having a members, the senior people after eight years do become qualified and they will be called fellows of ISG. And then we will have something called masters of ISG. Yeah. So we'll have three tire membership. And this is to basically attract young generation so that only after they remain a member of the ISG for eight years, they qualify to become a fellow. Yeah. So I think it's like, like some of the international bodies, uh, like ACG has a fellowship, uh, which I have been uh, uh, requesting many, many Indians to become. So I think we are changing the ISG structure in this, this respect. It's already been taken, a decision has been taken. Old guys like us, you know, what are the things you are going to give? Super masters, sir. Super <laughs> masters. Super masters. <laughs> Thank you. It was a nice a pleasure to uh, interact with all of you uh, and be a part of your meeting. It's a pleasure to have you here today. It's a honor, Mahesh. IAG Tamil Nadu chapter is honored to you have you as your speaker. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Real pleasure, thank sir. You. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Viji. Thank you, Prem. Yeah. Over to Ubal. Over to Over to Ubal. Sir, thank thanks, my sir, and uh, all the chairpersons. And uh, Prem, you are there. Yeah, I am there. <laughs> They said you're running. <laughs> <laughs> you always, always know the person who gives a vote of thanks, right? No, no, he's 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 okay. Watch whether he's going, is he speaking or just putting a video record. No, sir, I'm not. Thanks I'm, for I'm the wonderful lecture. Thank... Listen. <laughs> no, no, no. Very, very, very no, much no. online, sir. Very much online. Prem is, uh, Prem is having <laughs> mild fever, sir. So, no problem, problem sir. So, uh, on, uh, good evening, all. On behalf of the ISD Tamil Nadu chapter, I would like to. Profusely thank Dr. Mahishma Goenka who had uh, given us a very excellent lecture uh, for on the, the uh, endoscope role of endoscopists. I would uh, definitely I hope all of you agree. I would, would agree that it was an excellent talk. Thank you very much sir, for the excellent talk. Uh, next, I would like to thank our uh, patrons, uh, senior professors, uh, chairpersons, uh, postgraduates, and everybody who took an active part in, in making this meet a successful one. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Inkasol and team from Toron Pharma for helping us in conducting the program. And thanks once again, and then uh, we'll meet uh, next month uh, in next month's meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Good sir. night. Thank you once again, uh, Magesh. Thank you, sir. Just a reminder, send those 40 names. Yes, sir. It's 40, not only 40, 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. Yeah, we'll take care. We'll take care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bala is, Bala is behind everybody's back. Good to see Bala and Kathy sir and a lot, whole lot of my teachers there. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks for giving this opportunity. Nice to meet sir. Hi. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. Good night, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah.